Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the February 23rd Park and Recreation Commission meeting. It's a beautiful evening tonight and I'm looking forward to um, a good and uh, fruitful meeting. Catherine, would you take the roll, please? Commissioner Brown? Present. Commissioner Cribbs? Here. Commissioner Greenfield? Here. Commissioner LaMare? Here. Commissioner Moss? Here. Commissioner Olson? Here. Commissioner Reptal? Here. Council Member Coos? Here. All seven present. Great, thank you very much. Um, are there any agenda changes or requests or deletions from anybody? Okay, I don't hear any. So we will proceed with um, oral communications. Lam? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. If you could give us a moment here, um, my colleague is gonna put our timer on. Great. And our first speaker, once we're ready, will be George Moxie, to be followed by Arthur Keller. And George, if, if you would unmute and begin, please. George, uh, could you- Can you hear me? Online? We can hear you now, George. Super, hi commissioners, hi Lam. Um, it's nice to see you this evening. Just thought I'd come back and give you a very quick update uh, regarding our Baylands project that we're hoping to do. Uh, Lam and I have been in contact about the MOU draft that we sent to the city that he had forwarded to the attorney's office. Uh, they've come back and asked us to uh, convert that into a letter of intent. Um, I've received that back from our attorney today and I'll be reviewing it tomorrow with him and we'll be forwarding that back to Lam uh, tomorrow. So hopefully uh, things will continue to progress and we really appreciate your uh, support. Thank you. Thank you, George. Our next, our next speaker is author Keller to be followed by Mark Nadim. Uh, Lom, you have a different screen showing than the timer. Yes, let me ask uh, my colleague here to uh, make that change, please. Oh, thank you. Okay, author, if you would unmute, please. Thank you. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. I'm uh, trying to ex ex extrapolate on my um, remarks uh, that um, Adobe Meadow Neighborhood Association is opposed to a dog park at Ramos Park. We don't want a formal dog park because we'll attract for more, more dog owners will opposed to dog park because a formal enclosed park will attract more owners and dogs than currently used to park. It also intends to make the dog park a destination or attraction to owners for dog owners for a further distance. Ramos is a small neighborhood park and an increase in traffic and people would independently alter its neighborhood field. Many dog walkers in, use enclosed dog parks as an outlet for dog clients to run around and burn off energy. Based on the isolation of this additional park, they don't always watch the dogs that are charged with watching in the enclosed area. Dog owners have previously used the enclosed dog park in Mitchell Park and feel that dogs are brought to the enclosed park are not well trained and do not expose well commands. That's why dog owners take them to the enclosed area. A few dog owners have not have seen more aggressive dogs in the enclosed area and have their own dogs charged at an attack in a closed area. And that's why it will not go back to an enclosed area because of the experience. Some dog owners have seen their have seen their dogs leaving the dogs unattended in, in the enclosed area while going to exercise, basically leaving a, leaving a park as a babysitter. Sand and gravel that is put down in enclosed areas smell also as well as of, of urine as well as fences due to the nature of the, the many marks marked the vents. Once an enclosed park, public park is built, that area can no longer be used by anyone else, but it almost was too small a park to permanently close off that area to others.
All right. Our next speaker is Mark Nadine to be followed by Grant Elliott. If you begin, please, Mark. Okay. Excuse yeah, me. Mark. My name is Mark Nadim, and uh, I live on Alexis Drive. Uh, in late December and early January, there were a lot of cars on Alexis Drive uh, at the Alexis entrance to the park. Uh, these cars were parked along Alexis and Laurel Glen. Uh, we've seen as many as 15 to 20 cars parked at that time. The situation has changed at Foothills Park as I believe that the novelty uh, of, of the park is wearing off and is going to wear off further in the next few months. And as COVID restrictions are relaxed and sports events open up, less and less people will be coming to the park. We noticed the number of cars at the Alexis entrance uh, in the back of the park uh, have gone down to between one to five cars at a time. I go to the park once or twice a week, and I did notice that the number of people at the park on weekdays is much less than what it used to be in January. Uh, based on this, uh, on all this, I, I urge you not to have a knee-jerk reaction in implementing uh, restrictions and uh, entrance fees. And speaking of fees, uh, the question is, uh, why is, uh, why is uh, Palo Alto residents need to pay fees? I was attending a function at the San Francisco Botanical Gardens last week. And when I went to their website uh, to purchase tickets, I noticed that the San Francisco residents can enter for free. So why we don't implement similar things for Palo Alto residents uh, at the Foothills Park? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Our next speaker is Grant Elliott to be followed by Tally Katz. Hi, this is actually Sharon Elliott. <clears throat> We're using Grant's computer tonight. Um, I wanted to just say a few things about uh, the dog park at Ramos that has been projected. I think that constructing a dog park there where there's a lovely multi-use green space and converting it to a single use fenced area um, that will be used only by a small minority of the visitors is not a fair uh, decision. Many visitors unit, use it during normal times. Of course, with the pandemic, it's different, but usually there's volleyball there, soccer, catch, croquet, um, picnic areas are often spilling over into that area. So we really don't wanna see it become a single use area. And the other thing that we're very concerned about is that the dog park is going to be only 10 feet from neighbor's fences. And that makes neighbor's backyards almost unusable during lots of times when there will be dogs in the dog park area. And if people have pets in their own backyard, it will cause consternation for those pets. So I'd like to see that um, proposition taken off of the renovation plans for Ramos. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tally Katz to be followed by Robin Holbrook. Tell you begin, please. Hi, yeah, um, I've been uh, living on Ortega Court for about 35 years next to Ramos Park. Uh, and I wanted to second uh, Sharon and Grant's um, disapproval and opposition to um, the planned fenced in dog park um, as part of the renovations. Um, for the same reasons, um, I'll reiterate that um, it's only, it's planned to be about 10 feet away from the residences, which is um, unprecedented. We've not heard of a dog park like that in Palo Alto or out of Palo Alto that's so close to the residences. It's a small park. Um, secondly, it's not in accordance with the park's master plan which calls for um, additional dog parks in north, the northern part of Palo Alto. There are also, th there are already three 
dog parks in South Palo Alto, including Mitchell Park, which is only half a mile away from Remus Park. Um, um, and it, it, the planned park is much too small for a park. It's, um, if it's even smaller than the Greer Dog Park and the Hoover Dog Park, which are considered um, small according to the master plan. Um, and thirdly, it won't be used by the dog owners um, because of its size and because the dog owners uh, usually congregate there outside of the park. Um, and so it won't, um, won't, be, won't solve the problem that I think um, you guys were trying to solve for in the first place of uh, that congregating. So I would um, appreciate it if it would be taken off the table for consideration um, as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Tally. Our next speaker is Robin Holbrook to be followed by Flory Hutchinson. Robin, if you would begin, please. Hi, I'm uh, another member of the uh, Adobe Meadow uh, Neighborhood Association <laughs> Board. And um, I see that we have really come out in force to oppose the dog park in Remus Par Park. So uh, what I was planning to say is, uh, almost redundant at this point, but I would like to reiterate the uh, strongly made and uh, well phrased um, opposition to the dog park. When I first heard of the planned renovations at Ramos, I was thrilled. I am thrilled. I think that it would be wonderful to get a bathroom there to get other upgrades at this uh, small gem of a park. But um, I was originally not opposed to the idea of a dog park, but when I looked at the plans, uh, as has been mentioned, the proposed siting is right next to neighbors, right up against the backyards of neighbors on Ortega Court. And uh, it's such a small park. It's such a, a little gem of a park. Um, I go there every single day uh, on my walks around the neighborhood. And it is widely used by people in our neighborhood. It's, it's our neighborhood park. And I have uh, spoken informally with neighbors and uh, people in the park. And no one seems to be, I, I ran to one person who was in favor of having a fenced dog park there. But everyone else agrees that it is just too small for a dog park. And uh, it's, it's, it's a lovely little park as it is. It's just too small. I've been to all of the parks in Palo Alto. I'm a, an avid walker. And none of the other dog parks are in a park as small as Ramos. And it'll just impact the other park uses too greatly, I think. So I hope you can make this change. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Our next speaker is Flory Hutchinson to be followed by Michelle Rosengoss. Hi there, thank you so much. My name is Flory Hutchinson and I just wanted to voice my concern about the traffic on Alexis Drive as a resident of Palo Alto Hills. We moved on to Alexis Drive about three years ago and as a mother of four small children who are nine, seven, four and two years old, we regularly walk up Alexis Drive into the entrance to the Foothills Nature Preserve. And as I think Mark Nadim mentioned earlier, uh, we as a family of six have regularly counted upwards of 27 cars in the cul-de-sac parking at that entrance on Alexis Drive. And as a mom of four small children and not the only family on Alexis Drive with several small children, it's highly concerning for us from a safety point of view. Um, the other thing to note, in addition to the just sheer volume of cars parking up there, because of we are, where we are positioned on Alexis Drive, which is one of the big bends, I've noticed that the cars being non-residents are literally driving between 35 to 40 miles an hour around that bend, which is incredibly dangerous. And we've seen a higher frequency of car accidents on Alexis Drive in the last couple of months. 
So I just wanted to voice my concern both as a mom of small children and one of several families that lives on Alexis Drive. I believe there are about 7, 37 houses in Palo Alto Hills who personally use that entrance to the preserve by walking in, which also begs the question of the admission and tariff given that it is literally like our version of a backyard or park that we have used. And certainly due to COVID and having to be homeschooling my children, um, the usage from our point of view is nearly daily. So, um, so that's what I just wanted to voice tonight. Thank you, Flori. Our next speaker is Michelle Rosengast to be followed by Meg Winslow. Michelle, you could begin, please. Uh, good evening, and I'm Michelle Rosengaus. I live on Ortega Court. We've been here for 35 years, and we are the flag lot that is directly next to the fence of what is the proposed dog park. So I am voicing my objection to the construction of the dog park. I know that you have received a slew of emails from the neighborhood and from the Adobe Association um, voicing everybody's objection to this dog park. The, uh, the site, I mean, Ramos Park is really too small. And the site is sandwiched between our homes and the picnic area. And there's some very serious health issues regarding dogs using a mulched area. I mean, you don't wash the mulch and it just incubates all of the pathogens. If I open my windows, my nose is directly above what will be the proposed dog park. And also accepted guidelines are to have 120 feet as a buffer from the dog park and Ramos Park is way too small. Right now it's proposed to be 10 feet from my house and 10 feet from the picnic area. And even the houses across the street on East Meadow, I don't even think are 120 feet from the dog park. So I'm hoping that you will remove it from, from the renovations for the park. It is a really beautiful community park and we have babies all the way to seniors exercising there and everybody wants the green space and to enjoy some peace and quiet not a not a fenced in mulched dog park that's going to be used by a few dogs so i hope that you will keep our our green space as it is so we can all enjoy it thank you thank you michelle our next speaker is meg winslow to be followed by howard hoffman If you would begin, please, Meg. Well, Meg, are you still there with us? Okay, let us move on then. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Meg, we can hear you now. Hello? Please proceed, Meg. Hello? Meg, we do hear you. Um, how about uh, we return to you if you could uh, join the queue again and then I will uh, bring you up as, as the following speaker. I'm sorry. Okay. Our next speaker will be Howard Hoffman to be followed by Amy Horn. Hello, this is Howard Hoffman, and um, I'm the founder of Palo Alto Dog Owners, representing more than 300 dog owners in Palo Alto. And I think the verdict from the neighborhood around Ramos Park is pretty clear. And one of my best friends is one of those neighbors, and we had a nice discussion about this. And basically, he would rather keep the status quo, which is where people are using the park off leash illegally. And um, I tried to point out to him that that really is not ideal because that makes some of his neighbors into scoff laws. So really going back around the circle here, the best thing for these smaller parks, and we're talking about a number of them, not just Ramos, but we were talking about having um, a, a trial of off-leash hours 
And I think rather than constraining dogs in a fence, I think based on the cost and the impact, um, I think the best thing is to go back and actually give it a try to have off-leash hours at Ramos Park. I think that would be better. That's what's happening now. It's just not constrained by time. And so if we can go back to that concept of having legal off-leash hours, then I think that um, the neighborhood will be a lot happier. And I think it could be a great model for the rest of the city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. And we will try to return to Meg Winslow. Meg, if you could give another try, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Please proceed. Okay, okay I'm sorry. Um, I don't know. This may be the wrong place to bring this up, but I just wanted to know if this meeting is being broadcast on midpenmedia.org. I don't see it there, and um, I've been having some problems with Zoom. Um, so that, that's my question. Hello? It's, being, it's not being broadcast because another meeting is happening. Oh, okay, sorry, thank you. Thank you, Meg. Our next speaker is Amy Horn. Amy, if you would unmute, please. Hi, my name is Amy Horn. I live on Alexis Drive near Cliffville Park. And um, I wanted to make three points this evening and follow up on what Mark and Dean said earlier. Um, one is we walk up as a, we walk up and use you know, the Cliffville Park video as this entrance walk. And we have noticed um, a big growing volume of traffic, traveling at actually higher speeds than would be expected on the residential street. So we definitely appreciate help monitoring the traffic and the entrance coming into Alexis the Park, uh, sorry, through Alexis Drive into Cliffville. Um, secondly, uh, I, I did want to say that because we used to park on a very regular basis just walking up the road, um, family and I, we would like to make sure that for all of the residents um, that the fee, uh, especially for members, can be reasonable. Um, and then the third item that we would be just we would support sharing the park and resources with a wider base of population. But I would love to make sure that there's proper signage um, to encourage people not to live um, on the Alexis entrance into the field before starting to notice uh, toilet paper, uh, dog poop, um, just trash cans, so packaging, food packaging thrown out near the parking, the cars are parking the cul de sac. Uh, up at the top of Alexis. Um, and then even just walking around the park on the trails. And I was just there earlier this afternoon. You see toilet paper and you just see things that are just now luring what is supposed to be a, a nature preserve that can be enjoyed by all. So I would, I would urge proper signage um, and just education of uh, the greater number of people that come to use the park to make sure that it stays good for. Generations Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And Chair Cribs, that concludes speakers. Oh, thank you very much, Lam. Um, and thank you to all the speakers. We really appreciate your, th your thoughts and your comments and your consideration. So appreciate your being here. Um, let's go now to the department report, Darren. Thank you, Chair. Good evening. I'm Darren Anderson with Community Services Department. Uh, brief update on COVID-19. Santa Clara County is currently in the purple tier. However, on February 22nd, just yesterday, the state issued an update that said outdoor youth sports would be allowed to resume in California counties where the case rates of fewer than 14 new cases per day per 100,000 residents. And both San Mateo and Santa Clara counties meet that threshold. And this would take effect on February 26th, 2021. However, Santa Clara County hasn't made any updates to their website to reflect this. We would be obligated to follow the more restrictive of the health orders. Um, so if county follows state guidelines, there'd be a number of changes. Some of them, for example, would be that pickleball and tennis 
a double play would be allowed. Adult outdoor volleyball and softball would be allowed. And staff will continue to closely monitor Santa Clara County's website to see when they update uh, their health order to reflect this change with the state. And then I'd be glad to provide another update for the commission on all the things that would come about as a result of that. An update on the recreation divisions, uh, got some exciting programs starting in April. For example, there's indoor cooking classes at Lucy Stern Community Center for youth ages six to 13, spring cooking with junior chef stars, and classes will be held with one instructor in a stable cohort, a maximum of 14 students. There'll be indoor Lego engineering, uh, spring break camp at the Mitchell Park Community Center for youth ages five to 10, Jedi Engineering Spring Break Camp with Lego materials. And the camp will be held with one instructor and again, a stable cohort of 14. Uh, outdoor sport classes such as soccer and tennis will also be offered. The Boost program, an adult fitness program is offered in the outdoor patio of the Lucy Stern Community Center. And virtual programs are still being offered every quarter such as Communication Academy for Youth, Lego for Youth and Tai Chi for Adults. And you can find more uh, programs and full descriptions on the website. Uh, recreation staff um, is issuing field permits to youth groups, provided they adhere to all the requirements for youth recreation and athletics. And most of the youth teams are using the field spaces for practice and skill building. Coverly continues to remain closed to indoor rentals. However, there are several Coverly tenants and artists on the site that are able to continue their programs and operations while following county and state guidelines. The school district is also operating on site with special education classes. And as you saw in an email that was forwarded to the commission, uh, there was the potential imminent domain action by PG&E to take a portion of Coverly, but thanks to support from the community, uh, PG&E backed out. An update on youth golf. Uh, the Baylands Golf Links has resumed our very popular Youth on Course program, where youth age 18 and under may play for $5 on weekday afternoons after 2 p.m. Uh, staff is working on implementing a pollinator planting uh, design for the front area of Arastadero Garden. The design plan for the pollinator came from Juanita Salisbury. And Dr. Salisbury, you might recall, had done a presentation to the commission in the past on pollinator gardens that she's partnered with the city and built um, and developed along Embarcadero Road and a few other areas that are, are thriving and doing well. So we hope to replicate that at our Arrasadero Community Garden. On February 19th, this is last Friday, the Safe Parking Program at 2000 Gang Road opened. This is an area near the Baylands Athletic Center in the location where the Palo Alto Fire Station had temporarily stayed while their, their fire station at Rinconada was being reconstructed. The site can accommodate 12 vehicles and includes a building with a shower. And the nonprofit Move Mountain View, which oversees five other safe parking lots in Mountain View, will operate and oversee this site. A council approved this arrangement in September. Um, lastly, I had a request um, to give an update on the Highway 101 pedestrian and bike bridge. I contacted the project manager um, yesterday and she said that she's working on an updated schedule for the bridge installation and will provide an update to the commission very soon. So unfortunately, I don't have any more details on that one just yet, but glad to do so as soon as I have more info from her. And that concludes the department report. Darren, thank you very much for that uh, really exciting report as we uh, start to come out of, of COVID. I'm especially excited that the Baylands Golf Program for Youth is back. So great news on all of, all of what you reported. Are there other commissioners who have questions for Darren? I don't see any hands up. I have a quick question. Great. Um, just, just a clarification on the status of dog parks and Ramos Park, and it's, it's not on the agenda, so I'm not looking to go into details, just to understand, when this item last came to the commission, we were talking about the off-leash pilot program, and then public meetings have progressed, and it, it sounds like the, the focus now is away from the off-leash program and considering a, a formal uh, fenced-in dog park, and I thought that we had discussed previously that there was no budget available for that, so could you explain what the current direction is of discussions? 
Yeah, let me let me back up and start with the last commission meeting where we talked about this, where there was a tepid response uh, on the part of the commission for the off leash pilot program. There were concerns, numerous, which made staff want to go back to the community and offer other alternatives to see whether a dedicated fence dog park had any um, interest. And I think the clear response is no, they do not want a, a fence dog park. Um, there seemed to be some interest from the community for the off-leash pilot, but we've already, but not universal. And then again, that had been discussed with the commission and it also was sort of a tepid response. Um, in meeting with the ad hoc committee with Peter Jensen, who's sort of leading spearheading this endeavor, the feeling has been, let's not pursue a dog park at Ramos. Um, it is already separated from the improvement project. So it's not part of that at all. The intent was just to reach out to the community, gauge a response. I think we've done so and have our answer that a dedicated site uh, is not appropriate for Ramos. The next steps that the ad hoc has been talking about, and I believe um, Commissioner Moss, who's also on the ad hoc, provided this in the ad hoc update, yes. is that we'd be looking at other opportunities, areas much further away from residences as suggested by many of the attendees to the last community meeting. Thank you, I appreciate the clarification. Sure. Thank you, Darren. Are there other commissioners who have a question? Okay, I don't see any. Um, so let's move now. And thanks again, Darren, to business um, and the approval of the draft minutes from January 26th. Are there any changes, any additions to the minutes? I move that we approve the minutes. Thank you, Keith. And a second? A second. Thank you, Commissioner Moss, was that you? Yes. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, Catherine, would you do a roll call, please? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Commissioner Cribbs? Yes. Commissioner Greenfield? Yes. Commissioner Lemaire? Yes. Commissioner Moss? Yes. Commissioner Olson? Yes. Commissioner Rectal? Yes. Seven to approve the draft minutes. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, let's move now to the impact fee discussion and recommendations. Um, and I believe this is um, Darren Lindsay Wong or Kristen are yeah. you presenting this? Thank you, Chair. My pleasure to introduce the Community Services Director, Kristen O'Kane, and the Senior Budget Analyst, Lindsay Wong. Great. Thank you, Darren. Um, good evening, Commissioners. I'm Kristen O'Kane with Community Services. I'm actually going to let um, Lindsay Wong, who um, is our Senior Management Analyst, um, you probably remember Jasmine LeBlanc, um, who was here. Lindsay has taken over um, Jasmine's responsibilities on an interim basis. So I wanted to um, introduce her to you and she is going to introduce our consultant who will be giving a presentation on this item. So I'll turn it over to you, Lindsay. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Kristen said, I'm, I'm Lindsay Wong um, with the Community Services Department. Um, tonight, we will be presenting the Parks Community Center and Library Development Impact Fee Justification Study that was recently completed by our consultant DTA, and we will discuss their recommended updates to the fees. Um, they have a presentation for you tonight, and uh, just for some background, um, Palo Alto has imposed impact fees for new development since 2001 but the baseline fee levels have not been reviewed or updated in 20 years, nor has the actual cost inflation of land valuation in the city. Um, so the community services and library departments hired the consulting firm DTA to complete a development impact fee nexus study to determine the maximum impact fee levels that would be appropriate for Palo Alto. Um, and this was presented to Finance Committee on December 15th and is expected to be brought to Council in early March. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Nate Perez from DTA, who will present uh, the justification study that they completed and the recommended updates to the development impact fees. Fantastic. Does I have audio? Yes. 
All right. We can hear you. We can see you. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. Uh, Kristen, uh, glad to be here. Not, glad to be here tonight, commissioners. Uh, my name is Nate Perez. I'm a managing director with DTA. Uh, I've actually been working uh, uh, with the city of Palo Alto for, I don't know, probably started in 2013, 2014 on, on a series of projects. Um, so this update felt like a natural extension of some of the work we've previously done. Um, so we're, we're, I'm going to go through a brief slide deck. Um, you know, any fee in California is a really a function of some pretty simple math. And so we're going to try to demystify it tonight. It's really cost divided by your demographic profile. Um, you know, costs are driven in the park space by land. Uh, the, you know, the cost to acquire new acreage and uh, in a place like Palo Alto and coastal California and on the peninsula, I'm a San Jose resident, I'm in Willow Glen right now. Uh, that, the, that cost per acre is very high. And uh, as we all know, <laughs> especially homeowners. Um, and so that's gonna drive a lot of the fee. Um, Palo Alto has two uh, specific kinds of park fees that are in play. And uh, I'd like you to keep that in mind as I go through the presentation. Um, right now, there's a bit of a disconnect between those two fees. Um, and I think the really, really pressing uh, issue here is to create some convergence between those two fees and to bring them in, into alignment. So uh, we will get started and hopefully I can share my screen correctly. All right, screen one and we'll do. All right. Hopefully there should be a PowerPoint with a very garish red. Uh, let me know if that's not the case. So, okay. So, um, you know, this evening- uh, You're in preview mode still. I'm in preview mode. Oh goodness, uh, what a faux pas that I don't want to. Well, how about we just do it like this then? You know, I've, I've, I've done so many of these and it's still, it doesn't, I've done about 40 to 45 uh, virtual public uh, hearings, city council, board of supervisors, and it never really gets any easier. <laughs> so I um, have a new webcam set up, so hopefully that works out tonight. But um, so, you know, what we're going to talk about tonight, I want to talk about process, uh, you know, throughout this. Um, Impact fees are, are sort of enabled, uh, you know, for the lawyers uh, on the commission, the lawyers in the group by the Mitigation Fee Act, uh, Government Code 66,000, which was passed in 1987. I'm a, I'm a recovering land use attorney. So I, I really attack it from both a financial uh, angle and a legal and process angle. So we wanna make sure we're sort of crossing our T's and dotting our I's at, at every opportunity and every juncture there. Um, we're also gonna talk about demographics. Um, Palo Alto is an interesting uh, community. Um, you know, sort of the scale of, of sort of new community that's uh, uh, maybe a new master plan uh, and, you know, on one end of the spectrum and, and full build that on the other end of the spectrum. I think we know what Palo Alto, you know, from a land use perspective is closer to. Uh, and so that uh, creates some interesting uh, elements of any nexus study that's going to be done in the city. And then uh, for parks, uh, separate from community centers and separate for, for library, we're going to talk about inventory and we're really going to talk about what people want to hear about, which is what the fee is currently and what it's going to. So a um, little bit of background about DTA. As I mentioned, we've worked with the city of Palo Alto for quite, for quite some time. Uh, um, you know, founded in 1985, really specialized in public finance and urban economics. Uh, we've done over 500 uh, impact fee studies uh, in California alone. Uh, I project manage now pretty, almost 110 of those. Um, I brought in a lot to, um, come in as an expert witness, uh, be deposed, I'm going to trial next month, uh, not for one of the studies we did. Uh, but so, you know, we, we bring a lot of sort of multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary um, chops to this. We have engineers on staff, hydrologists on staff, land use planners on staff, attorneys on staff. But really, we, we come at it through the, through the lens of public finance. How do we cobble together money for public agencies so you guys can build what you need to build and or maintain what you need to maintain? Uh, we specialize historically a lot in special districts as well, CFDs, assessment districts, um, thing, things of that nature. So um, a little bit of background, as Lindsay mentioned, um, the city has actually, you know, a host of impact fees, but the impact fees we're talking about tonight are park, community center, and library, which uh, folks are a little bit confused, are, are very often grouped together. Um, you sort of, I call them quality of life impact fees. Uh, and so it makes sense to sort of evaluate them. Uh, the usage factors tend to be similar. Um, and, and the benefits tend, tend, tend to be similar. Um, the city did, did adopt a, a, a 
uh, impact fee program for those three fees in 2001. Uh, it really hasn't revisited since. And um, I, you know, I don't know if any of you have owned your home in Palo Alto since 2001 and have sort of a locked in assessment, but a lot's changed. Uh, and uh, you know, that, 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 needs, that needs to be covered and that, and that needs to, to, to be addressed, um, not only for financial reasons, but also for nexus reasons. Um, uh, you know, we are trying to draw a nexus between the, the calculation of the fee and the justification of the fee and what uh, your parks and rec uh, community center and library departments are accomplishing. And so, you know, I usually recommend every five years, of course, I'm a consultant. That means you hire me more, but t at least every 10 years, I like to see, I think 20 years is a bit too long. Uh, and really uh, the, the, the key takeaway from this process, which already went to finance committee is the development of an, of a, uh, you'll hear a lot of different names, but um, the simplest one is a, a nexus study. And that nexus study is going to define the maximum fee that the city can charge. And the and city council will hopefully approve that study and adopt it. Now, this doesn't mean city council has to charge that maximum fee. Far from it. Um, but uh, that maximum fee defines sort of, you know, the maximum nexus and the maximum uh, cost recovery that you can have. So, Beginning with a little bit of an overview, and, and, and sorry, for, sorry for the graphics, we're you know, always trying to update our clip art, but really uh, in the park space, uh, community center and library space, and if I start to just say parks as a proxy for all three, uh, I apologize, no offense to community center and library, it, it, it is the bulk of the fee here, but um, in, you know, in the park space, the first thing we have to do is really uh, figure out what our level of service is in the community. Uh, and that's the inventory that, that I note here. And what we did is we, um, survey, you know, Lindsay and Lindsay's team and Lom's team and their counterparts in the various other departments to try to figure out what, what, what do you guys have? Because once we know what you guys have and we figure out your demographics in your community, we know your level of service. We know your acres per thousand residents. We know your number of ball fields per thousand, things of that nature. And then the goal is to provide that level of service to future residents. And so you're extending it forward because if future residents don't defray the cost and, and make sure that level of service is maintained, what happens very logically is a deterioration of that level of service. And so there's a lot of different ways to calculate impact fees. And some of you guys, um, I'm sure, you know, you know, and I don't joke, and, I, and I'm not joking, I've, I've been in front of Palo Alto City Council enough, you, some of you may actually be rocket scientists. There, there are different ways to calculate impact fees. This is the most common in the park space is this level of service approach. At the end of the day, you uh, end up with a fee that's calculated typically by unit or uh, per non-residential square foot. And that's that final column. Okay, so where do we begin? We begin with an inventory and, th and this might feel familiar, it might not feel <laughs> familiar, but it it's just figuring out what our existing facilities are and, and really categorize them as best we can. It's not as intuitive as folks might think because certain facilities, um, you know, a pickleball court and a basketball court may, <laughs> uh, may not equal um, you know, uh, technology upgrades at Coverly may not equal, uh, you know, uh, sod upgrades and Rinconada. I mean, so, so there's, there's a bit of a disconnect um, sometimes. And so we do try to sort of use some of these larger buckets to sort of group these things together so we can manage it. Because in any one of these impact fee studies, there might be a thousand inputs. And, and you know, it, it can sort of become a little cumbersome to review. But really, the, the, key, the key elements that, that are driving your fee and the fee calculation in Palo Alto are really the, the acres of city parks and the acres of natural open space. Um, so this would be uh, just a quick example of your park inventory, which is uh, discussed in the staff report and in the, the study as well. Um, community center, I think you guys know these five really well and the square, square footage, what might be a better uh, proxy rather than acreage. Um, not all square footage is created equal, of course. Uh, we try to control for that, you know, think, think air conditioning rooms and things of that nature. But at the, you know, at the end of the day, we do need to talk with the city's real estate brokerage team and, and come up with a number. Libraries are very, very similar. Square footage is, is, is sort of king or queen. Uh, volumes of textbooks is also very, very critical. Um, and a uh, little, little note here, because I'm sure this is, a, this is a very studious group. Um, th things that have sort of been noted as integrated units, technology upgrades, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Uh, you'll note that there's five different libraries. We have five integrated units. We do, we do that to really sort of collapse it for pricing. And essentially what we're saying is that there's that there's sort of a, a level of service related to technology at each of these five. And so if those need to be updated, we would sort of roll them out across all five over a 10 to 20 year period. So that, that that's what that integrated unit means. Uh, it's just, it sort of helps us uh, uh, cost it out appropriately. 
So we have this inventory, right? We're trying to find a level of service, which we can extend forward. The inventory is the numerator, the denominator will, will essentially sort of be our demographics. Um, we look at Department of Finance, we look at uh, city finance documents, we look at AVAG. Um, right now in Palo Alto, and there's been a shift in Palo Alto about, you know, housing and priorities and goals, and it, it's fantastic. And, and a lot of this was really sort of memorialized in the 2017 EIR, the Environmental Impact Report that the city processed. Um, and really, uh, this the, what we understand to be the selected scenario, which is scenario three. Um, and so, you know, what you guys see on the left here, and this is directly from the EIR, is is sort of, you know, estimates of the city's population. Uh, city employees, is, um, you guys know better than I do, is, is, is not that easy of a number to to pin down, um, you know, you, you don't have a clicker there. And if you don't have a, I'm not trying to bring up a source spot, but if you, if you don't have a business license tax or a per head tax, it can be a little tricky, but we're, we, so what we do is we cross-reference these numbers with our own data sources or our own data platforms. Uh, we do this in so many communities, we have a pretty good feel for it. And so we, va we validate them and we validated these. And on the right side is, is really, um, there's some 2030 totals. This impact fee study is um, has a 20 year horizon. So it's gonna go 2020 to 2040. So we've taken those 2030 numbers and we've extrapolated them out to 2040. Um, and um, you, so we, we essentially compare uh, the gap between existing residents and the future residents who are created between 2020 and 2040. Excuse me, existing residents uh, in existing employees versus future residents and future employees. And so these, these are just some summaries, uh, you know, sort of some nice, lovely uh, tables. You know, generally Palo Alto is, is about 67,000 residents. Uh, num numbers may not some due to rounding, of course. Uh, um, and uh, number of housing units by single family, multifamily. It's very, very common um, in the impact fee space to um, draw a distinction between single family and multifamily just because of uh, typically the number of persons you have in, in each of those households. Also, I think there's an economic argument about um, uh, you know the, the fee that can be that can be uh, borne by uh, each of those product types, um, and so you know we see um, existing uh, equivalent dwelling units, which is just sort of a, a fancy term for how we uh, standardize uh, different land uses, and uh, we use a single family home as our base, and uh, projected future uh, equivalent dwelling units, and so uh, you know it's really essentially the same metric, and what we're looking at is is you know is, is you know, a ten to fifteen percent growth over the next twenty years. If, if you grow at 1% a year, um, you know, it, it compounds. So you might be 24% at the end of the 20 year horizon. If you grow at about 0.5 to 0.7%, you end up somewhere between 10 and 15% over your current population. And, and um, you know, we felt that that was very much in line with the, with the scenario three. And we ran these figures through finance. We ran these figures through the planning department and through the finance committee. Uh, a little bit more interesting, or maybe perhaps not. Uh, this doesn't drive a lot of the fee is the commercial component of it. Uh, you have to figure out some ratios uh, of, uh, between commercial and in this case, hotel and motel are the two categories that you guys have historically charged. And we try to figure out a way to equalize that with single family housing. Um, and we charge these fees on a sort of a per thousand square foot chunk. So rather than per unit, it tends to be per thousand square feet. And you can see on the top is sort of your existing portfolio of, 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 of millions and millions of square feet. And the bottom would sort of be the portfolio of the square footage and the employees that we would expect to add. Uh, and if you can see that 96,000 figure, that sort of dovetails very, very nicely with uh, uh, this, this, this demographic, uh, this 95,000 figure, which by the way was in 2014. So it makes sense that it was a little bit off uh, in uh, slide 11. So just try to figure out the demographics. You can't really figure out the future until you figure out the base. And then you set those two off to figure out the relationship between those two things. So now we have a level of service and I apologize if you hear some scream, screaming in the distance, uh, <laughs> nothing I can do about that right now, um, is uh, we apply that level of service to our cost, our cost metrics and our cost centers. And the idea is that, okay, well, we know what we have to extend forward, the number of acres per thousand people, the number of ball fields per thousand people. Well, what do they cost, right? Because if, if you don't know what they cost, you don't have, you only have a ratio. You don't have a fee that you can uh, charge moving forward. And so um, this is where land valuation becomes a very, very critical element and figuring out um, what that is and how that compares to communities in, on the peninsula as your peers um, is, is really the number one key component of a, of a park impact fee study. Uh, and also uh, 
uh, I believe it's the most important of a library and community center impact fee study, though not as predominant as you see in the park space. I'm going to pause here because right here we have a park impact fee and a Quimby fee, and I'm sure you guys know the difference, but it can be a little, a little bit uh, confusing and, and intricate. Um, there's two sort of legal structures under which you can charge an impact fee in California um, uh, to enabling legislations. Um, you typically charge a Quimby fee for a subdivision, uh, for uh, a subdivision, you know, uh, an act, subdivision map act, someone who has a track map for more than 50 housing units. That would sort of be the classic Quimby fee. The classic Quimby fee would apply in Fresno County, Madera County, Riverside County, where you see massive subdivisions of land into residential product. Uh, where a Quimby fee doesn't really work very well is when you're under 50 units, actually doesn't work at all legally, or when you have a mixed use project. So you have this disconnect. And so uh, there's another enabling legislation, which is the government code 66,000, the Mitigation Fee Act, which is how you typically charge traffic fees, fire fees, I did the city's public safety fee a couple of years ago that that is under the mitigation fee act. And um, you can very much end up in the same space, um, but it, it, the city is using it and Kristen or Lindsay step in if I'm misspeaking. Um, but sort of it, it is sort of a bifurcated approach and you're going to see a little bit of the tension which this fee study hopes to resolve between these two fees. And so um, into both calculations goes a sort of a base valuation per acre. And I know this is a big number, somewhere between $4 million and $5 million an acre. Uh, I assure you that it's not based on comps. We use CoStar data, we use Nielsen data. Uh, we spend tens of thousands of dollars a month on data platforms basically for this purpose. We smooth out the data, we remove highs, we remove lows. We don't look at the most prime residential developments either for the acreage. We're looking at sort of more, so you know, the, the, the kind of acreage you would purchase to acquire a park. And, um, and that needs to be updated. And, and, it's, and in your Quimby fee, it's been somewhat updated, but in your park impact fee, it really hasn't. And so that's created this tension where, um, that we need to resolve. And so, and you've seen this final bullet point, what we're proposing is to update the mitigation fee act fees, and then also update the land valuation in the Quimby uh, park fee. They are separate code sections in your municipal code. We'd like to clean them both up and call it a day. So that, that's, that's sort of the, the process related element of it. But that land valuation factor uh, is critical. And so what we have now is, as we mentioned, this 3.9 million figure, that's what's in your code. Um, that has been updated. And we understand that, that figure right now is approximately, for your Quimby fee, is about $5.1 million uh, per acre. And you can see some other communities on the peninsula. You can see our suggestion of taking it to about 5.7 million. I, I would argue that's, that's not a very large adjustment because this fee this element of your fee program is much closer. Uh, we did the Campbell update. Uh, they ended up selecting 3 million. We actually recommended closer to four. Um, Santa Clara was recently done. Saratoga's is being updated. Mountain Views is being updated. And actually San Jose is, is uh, currently uh, issue, just issued an RFP and should be issuing an award very soon uh, to update their uh, land valuation. So, you know, you wanna be close to your neighbors, of course, but your neighbors are always updating their fee studies as well. You do it every 10 years. There's this tendency to sort of surge and fall behind a little bit. And I would argue that I don't think your surge here is, is, is really unwarranted. And I would also argue that as far as a community and land value, Palo Alto, even with these peers is actually uh, unique. And I, I've, I found that in my pre previous work with the city uh, over the past seven or eight years. So what does this mean? What does this land valuation mean for you guys? Because right now it's just a number. This is the tension, and this is the tension between the Quimby fee and the park fee. And you can see right here is right now the fiscal year 1920 Quimby fee is about $62,000 per home. So it's not not low, uh, but you know it's a function of the value of land. It's a direct, it's a direct output of the value of land in your community. And but right now the actual AB 1600 park fee uh, from 2001 is 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 stuck in the past. And we see this and we see big updates when we do this. We don't get hired to do 3% updates. You can fix that with CPI. So we have a little bit of this tension where we uh, have a gap where certain folks with big projects who are subdividing would be paying a Quimby fee and folks with smaller projects or with a mixed use project would be paying this, uh, this lower sum. And so we identified that and we thought that, that was something that sort of needed to be brought, brought into alignment. Now, it doesn't mean that you necessarily need to charge the $62,000. we are setting maximum fees here, and you, you can charge lower. Actually, this, we could update that $12,000 figure, and the city could, continue, could decide to continue to charge it. 
Um, obviously, it's been a very, very interesting year with COVID. Um, and, and so, you know, but we feel that from a, a, a nexus justification perspective that, that, that we would like to bring these uh, into alignment. So what our fee program actually has done is by updating that base land valuation whether it's 5.1 million, we've actually selected 5.7 million, both in our Quimby fee and in the AB 16, the, the Mitigation Fee Act fee. The first column is your Quimby fee, what the, the result of a, of a slight update, right, from 5.1 to 5.7. And the second column would be essentially, and I'm going to go back, and I'm sorry if this is, is you know, um, would, would be an update 20 years in the making. And, and that, that, that's, a, that's, a big, that's a big change. And we're gonna talk about that because it, it needs to be talked about. But because all of the costs are essentially stuck in late 90s dollars, both land value, I think the imputed or implied land value in the old study is about a million bucks an acre. Construction costs, similarly, all of these things are just are, 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 are from 20 years ago. I mean, there's really, there's, <laughs> it's not unique. It's not, even, it's not even surprising. It's just when you don't update something for 20 years and you see five to 10% year over year growth in housing prices, if not higher in Palo Alto, you end up with a, um, a bit of a disconnect. And so what we've done here is by recalculating the AB 1600, excuse me, the mitigation fee act fee. I don't want to use too many different, uh, different sort of acronyms and codes. I apologize. Uh, and, 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 and updating the Quimby fee, we see better convergence between the two. Um, there's some slight distinctions between how the fees are allowed to be calculated um, on, on, under state law. So it, it's hard to arrive at perfect convergence, you know, 100% on the dollar, but we feel that this is definitely a step in the right direction to sort of, um, uh, sort of tidy up the house. Next slide. So what does this mean? You guys saw that $12,000 figure and now I'm showing you a $57,000 figure. Holy cow, sticker shock. And you know, I've somehow stopped talking about community centers and library as well for a little while. Community centers and library, we see the construction costs driving a need for an update. We don't see it, um, the land is not, you're not acquiring fresh acreage in quite the same way. Um, and you know, it's, 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 it is sort of much more difficult. You tend to see teardowns and rebuilds rather than the acquisition of, of, of new acreage and then the installation of a park on that acreage. And so um, the, the, the increases in the community center and library fee that we're proposing are, are, are much smaller, uh, but you are really reflecting the, the increase in construction costs, labor, trade uh, over the past 20 years. Uh, the park is driven by that and the increased land valuation. And so, you know, the, the, the new mitigation fee act fees that we're proposing, while now converging with your, uh, the Quimby fees that you're charging and that you have been charging very, very close, it, it is, is in some respects a, you know, a, a 2x, uh, if not 3x increase. Um, and um, so we took a look at that. We met with finance committee. We know that that is, you know, sort of a bit of an eye opener. Um, you know, I mentioned the other um, cities and agencies on the peninsula. Their fees are much closer to this one that we're proposing now than they are to your old, your old fee of 12,000. And I believe that information is in the staff report as well. Um, so in many ways, you're, you're really sort of leveling up. But what we've proposed and more what we're thinking about proposing to council, and we love your feedback, is coming up with a sort of a four-year tiered approach um, and phasing in any increases. This is this is sort of a busy, my colleague Kyle is on and she did her best to try to put this on one slide and it's sort of busy, but it's sort of four quadrants. And the idea is that we're, that we're just sort of um, uh, taper measured uh, increases and phasing in those increases, 25% of maximum cost recovery, 50%, 75%, and then 100%. And, and we like this approach because it, it, it helps with the sort of that noticing function with the development community. Anyone who has a map that's currently in process and they're not gonna be surprised. And it gives time people uh, you know, an opportunity to adjust, adjust to the change uh, and, and to sort of uh, phase, phase in that change. So this was something that we've recently come up with since we met with finance committee. Uh, we thought four years was, was appropriate. Um, because you know, ultimately at the end of four years, you're getting back to sort of fully justified cost recovery levels. And if you don't get back there quick enough, each one of these years, you're, you're sort of, you know, essentially subsidizing the fee program through, through, through other channels and other avenues. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, th this would sort of be the, the this, this fee program. This is not your entire fee load. As I mentioned, we worked on the public safety fee, you have a traffic fee, you have an affordable housing fee. Um, Affordable housing fees everywhere tend to be uh, 
large. I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, but you know, this is one that that needed to be updated. Twenty years old. It needed to be brought into line alignment with your Quimby fee. Um, it, it it needed a Nexus refresh. But given the given the change and given the you know everything that's going on in the world, we felt we felt that phasing in that approach is probably more appropriate um, as a recommendation. And of course, the council is well within their discretion to say, we accept the report if they choose to accept it, of course. Um, and we're gonna charge less than that out into the future or something like that, uh, especially with everything going on in the world. And I know I keep saying that, but <laughs> it is very real. And um, so the you know, council will have full discretion every year to revisit these fees um, and, and to you know, decide really what's best. Uh, more fee revenue, uh, more money, of course, for parks. Uh, I have, with uh, the Parks and Rec Commission, I, 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 would, I would be loath to, to not bring that up. And so um, it, it, it will uh, provide additional revenue. And Lindsay and I had tried to estimate it. Uh, it's, it's not perfect. Um, the fee tends to get collected all at once. A lot of um, projects are paying the Quimby fee, which is very, very close to the proposed new Quimby fee. But, but, you know, we estimated, and Lindsay, please jump in, or Kyle, please jump in, that, you know, potentially, you know, would it be an additional about a million bucks a year um, to sort of bring online to, 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 to fix this, what I view as a gap. Um, and by the way, and just with staff and, and everyone, I want to be very clear, I do this all over California. These gaps are common. Uh, this isn't a particularly interesting <laughs> topic for most folks. It's what I do, but it's not it's something that everyone loves to do. And, and so, I, you know, remember how I mentioned I, I recommend every five years. Most folks aren't doing this, uh, you know, any any more frequently than every ten years. And so, you know, what happens? Staff transitions, things like that. So I, I have plenty of communities that uh, have been. We're, we're looking at updates from the late '90s. So I, I, I do want to make that point clear. But those are our recommendations. Um, you know, it, it it it's a path for additional revenue, which you know I know uh, sales tax and TOT is a huge part of uh, Palo Alto's general fund, and and I think you know uh, I know. All staff has been working hard to be really creative there, and and this would contribute to that. It, does it fix anything? Does it build? Um, does, you know, does it build a project day one? No, because you need permits to collect these, and then you, you have multiple permits, hundreds of permits, you have dozens of permits, and then hundreds of permits to collect these funds, and they're because they are pay as you go revenues, and so then you develop a bit of a you know. Um, uh, uh, you know, a revenue count a, account that's finally big enough to do something, and then you draw it down, and that that's sort of the common practice with impact fees. So, uh, I've been blathering on for a while, uh, so let me uh, open it up to uh, questions and comments, and I will uh, just be muted, and I will stop sharing my screen if I can. But if anyone has a question about a specific slide, I'm happy to jump back and pull up that slide. You're muted. Me, and you're muted. I'll start over again. Thank you, Nate. Um, and thank you, Lindsay and Kristen. I think what we'd like to do is see if any commissioners um, have specific questions or comments. And then um, Kristen, you're asking for an action tonight. So we are need, gonna need a motion. Yes, um, it, I'll just confirm with Darren that that's how the agenda item was written that it would be an action? That's correct. It's it looks action. like it, yeah, that there's yeah. an action. So needed. this is going to council on March 8th. And what we'd like to do is include a recommendation from the commission on whether you support the fees or um, the tiered fee approach. So either way, we, we would like to include a recommendation from the Parks and Rec Commission in our staff report. Okay, well, thanks for, thanks for clarifying that. Um, it was very interesting to get this um, staff report and go through it and actually brought up um, kind of several questions for me about um, why we haven't done it for 20 years and now I understand that and why um, Palo Alto is, seems to be out of line or more than um, other cities and the fact that other cities are gonna be catching up and that kind of thing. It just was, it was very interesting how parks were treated in community centers. So I appreciate having some of this, but I'm sure that there are questions from other commissioners. So if you would raise your hand and um, vice chair, I would ask your help to look for um, people who have their hands raised because I'm clearly not seeing them and I keep missing people. So um, if you would, uh, kick me under the table since you can't do that. Um, let me know if you see any hands that are raised. So let's start with David. 
Commissioner Moss? Yeah. Um, so I think what I uh, saw briefly is a 157% a increase for a single family home uh, over the, the four year tiered fee approach. Is, is that uh, correct? Yeah. Yes, that's and, correct. And um, I've been on this commission for uh, five years. Uh, is that right, Ann? Five years? Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, several years ago, we created the Parks Master Plan, the 25 year, 20 year ma Parks Master Plan. And the first question that, that the uh, city council and the mayor asked us is, how do we pay for it? So I'm all in favor, even though I own a single family home, uh, I'm in favor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Recto. Okay, I had some clarifications. Uh, can you go back to slide 13? Sure. Okay. I can pull this up as well. All right, hopefully you guys have it up. Okay, I'm confused about the employees per thousand square feet, the fifth column there. That, that point 0.8 employees per thousand, that seems very low. Uh, how, how are you calculating that column? So, so, so that, that, that would be when it's, when it's ran through an adjusted employee factor. So really that would be times five because those adjusted employees in that middle column, uh, we're accounting for the amount of, um, uh, time in the week that an employee could theoretically or hypothetically um, uh, visit a park. And, and we believe mm. it's usually around 15 to 20%. And so we're taking those employee figures and we're reducing them because an employee is not the same as a resident under this structure because they have less of an opportunity to uh, visit a park. And so those employees per thousand square foot um, should really be adjusted employees per thousand square feet. And so you would see you know, 4.0 in the commercial industrial space, which might feel a little bit more like some of the office and retail metrics that you guys might be familiar with. Even 4.0 seems, you're saying, oh, that, that's, the, that's the time period. So yeah, yes. What are you basing, how many square feet per employee are you using? Just so, gross. So, so yeah, actually, um, a lot, a lot of studies use ratios. Um, sometimes you'll see somewhere between, you know, two point five per thousand, or uh, sorry, uh, two hundred fifty square foot per employee, or five hundred square feet per employee. In the industrial space, you might see around a thousand square feet per employee, up to two thousand. We actually are using uh, existing building square footage uh, figures from CoStar, and then we uh, have assigned your employees to those the NAICS codes associated with those. So we believe the ratio is actually. Um, it, it, it's not sort of an industry standard ratio that we would use in a lot of places where it was hard to nail down. Um, so we would believe if you would follow me, a 0.8 ratio for commercial industrial, it would be an adjusted ratio. So times five, because we have a 20% reduction would be about four employees per thousand square feet. So about 250 square foot square feet per employee, which you would see more in the high density office space. Um, remember this is smoothed out across all kinds of commercial and industrial, of course. But, but that, that, that was sort of, if you would invert the numbers, that's how you would end up there. Yeah, 250 square feet, that's a lot of space. M most new companies are much less than that. You don't see anything above two anymore. I mean, you, the ones that opened in San Francisco in the last year or two, they've all been like one, 150. And so, I mean, that has a direct issue because when you're talking about, we're not billing this per employee, we're billing this per square feet. But all your calculations are assuming what uses will employee make of the park. And so we're off by a factor of 40% now because we, we are assuming that there's going to be less employees than there really is. They're going to pack them in at 150 and we're assuming 250. And so we're not going to be building that development enough to account for its park use. I'm, uh, per, perhaps, I, you know, I, I think the, um, you know, there's a tension between the residential and non-residential. Um, and so, you know, uh, an impact fee study is a little bit like whack-a-mole, you know, the costs are covered, you know, this would just change the ratio between the various uh, land use types. Um, it, it doesn't leak out. Um, it, it is the existing ratio. I, I, do, I do think you make a great point about the future ratio though. 
um, and, and how that may be high. And we can, uh, I can work with Kyle Martinez and my staff and Lindsay to, to provide um, some feedback on, on what that might do to the figures. I, I think you know, the total EDUs, if, if, you, if you're following the column far to the right, um, that, that's the actual figure that gets baked into the uh, denominator. Um, it's not a big component of the fee study. So I think the change would be pretty uh, small, but we can absolutely evaluate it. And I, I think it's a great point. I mean, I think you're, you, you definitely agree. Um, and uh, and, office and really I don't know for sure, right? But this is the maximum that we can charge. And you wanna be as pessimistic as possible because you've tied your council's hand. They can't go higher than this but they can go lower. And Absolutely. so if you're being too generous and saying that every employee gets 250 square feet, you've tied the, the council's hand to not be able to build an, enough parks to accommodate when the players have 150 square feet per, per person. Uh, agreed, agreed. Um, the, the one, the, uh, one note that, and, and I, I know Palo Alto's sort of commercial industrial stock is vastly, vastly office and office of a, of a particular kind and quality. It, it is blended across sort of all categories, including retail, including food service and things of that nature. So, um, but I, but I, but I, I do hear you and I, I do agree as a, as a, as a, as a uh, you know, as a leaseholder in, in the Bay Area of multiple office properties for DTA. I, I do look at these things and, you know, we, we, get, we can pack them in more than we used to. So what I can do is I, I don't think it adjusts the, the, the base ratio, but that future ratio, uh, we can get you some feedback on, 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 on what that might do uh, to the figures. Um, I, 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 I do think it's, it's gonna be compressed, but we, we can provide you that feedback, definitely. Okay, thank you. And I had another clarification. The amount that we're, uh, for land value, your estimate of 5.7, uh, that also seems very low. Uh, you, you can't buy anything for 5.7 million per acre in Palo Alto. Uh, how did you come up with that? So, so what we'll do uh, when, when, we, when we look at the stock is, you know, we, we, we control for, for, for typically for residential transactions and remove those. And so we're looking at uh, sort of typically class B kinds of transactions and land that would be valuable, uh, less value be, because of its, its location. And I, I know that's um, uh, may not be exactly what, what, fo what folks want to hear. Um, and then, but, uh, you know, because, you know, you're not going to go buy, you know, Zuckerberg's <laughs> land to, to put a park on it. Um, but, uh, and then we control for highs and lows, uh, typically uh, trying to carve out anywhere from five to 10 to sort of smooth out the averages. And, and, and we did arrive through a couple of different methodologies at that at a, at a five to six figure. However, I do think that the city could very easily justify a higher figure. Um, it will just, you know, 20% higher here, the fee will be 20% higher. I, 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 I do think that this is conservative but we felt that with the, um, the increase, the percentage increase that Commissioner Moss noted over 20 years, we, we felt that it was sort of important to maybe take this in manageable chunks if 157% increase is a manageable chunk. But I, 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 I don't disagree with you. I, I, I think that 5.7 figure is uh, probably on the conservative side. So Nate, um, you see where this, is, where this is all coming from. Obviously we're very passionate about parks and having enough money to uh, uh, generate new parks and pay for existing parks. So Keith, thank you very much for that. Um, do you have another quick question? Well, I'm anxious to move us on a yeah, little no, bit. This is, this is important. Uh, Good, it I mean, is important. Yeah, I mean, the, the 5.7 I think is low, but it's very much low. I mean, if you look at recent transactions, most of our parks are surrounded by residential areas. So if we're gonna expand any parks, we're likely gonna be buying neighboring houses. Right. And and if it's and if you look at the recent sales, they're all in the neighborhood of 20 million in North Palo Alto, 30 million per acre. So if those are the lots that we're gonna have to be buying to expand the the parks, we really shouldn't be booking two point, I mean five point seven. We're gonna be way off and won't be able to park buy the parkland that we need. I, I yeah, uh, well well put, well made. I I, I mean I, I do think that they're uh, you know, some, an opportunity to, to, to uh, increase this a bit. 
Um, I think our, our, our recommendation, uh, you know, uh, from DTA was, was given the time that has passed, um, perhaps, you know, sort of right the, right the ship, so to speak. We could always come back very quickly thereafter uh, if this is not cutting it um, and, 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 and do a further update. Um, it's actually quite easy and quite affordable for the city to do that. Uh, we were a little reluctant to push on that 157% increase, but if that is the council's direction, I, I think that that, you know, commission's direction and the council's direction, I think that 5.7 figure could very easily and justifiably be six to seven. I think beyond that, I, I, I would, I would, I would suggest that we're you know, looking at more prime uh, acreage, but um, I have seen uh, folks uh, attempt to do that. So um, if staff and, and the commission and, and the council would, would like to see that push, we can we can take a look and come back. And again, so, we're, we're not buying mythical lots, we're buying real lots. And if those lots are 20 million an acre, we should be booking 20 million an acre. So Keith, is that something that you'd like to see in the staff report? Yeah, I mean, I th this is something that has to be addressed. I think. But anyway, uh, you've got, you have my point. I'll, yeah, I'll, we do you. have your point. Thank you very much. Um, you. Commissioner Brown. Oh, excuse me just a minute. Um, uh, Vice Chair Greenfield is trying to speak, but he can't. We have a technical issue. He can't raise his hand for some reason. Can you try again, please, to raise your hand right now and see if I can see it? No. That, that, that's okay. I, okay, we'll go back to Commissioner Brown, then I'll come back to you, okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm not in a hurry. Commissioner okay. Brown? I have yes. Four fairly quick questions, um, I think. Of course. Um, so the first one is on slide 10 about ABAG. Um, I know you said that was part of the numbers, part of the information that you use. Are you using the latest ARENA numbers? And since those are not final, how are you going to deal with the address, the updated ARENA numbers? Because I appreciate Commissioner Rechtel's point about um, buying houses, but we also have ARENA numbers that we, the town, uh, the city needs to live up to. Uh, so the ARENA numbers, yes. Uh, that's sort of, I think, the... Uh, it's going to be the, and it's more than the elephant in the room, it's going to be the room uh, for 2021 and beyond. Uh, council member, uh, I'm going to butcher his last name, but I want to say Dubois or du Dubois. Um, I'm just remembering how it's spelled. I uh, had a similar question. Right now, because they're preliminary, uh, we, we haven't utilized it. We felt that looking backward to the 2017 EIR, which was the product of a lot of discussion, um, was, was a bit safer. Um, but once those numbers are f finalized and not only finalized, but internalized probably in an updated housing element, I do think it would be appropriate to, to provide an update at that time. Um, what's exciting about it is that, um, the, the, the pressures are sometimes counterintuitive. You add more units and everyone's, oh, we're going to get more money. You're going to get more money because there's more permits though. The actual per unit amount may may drop when you sort of rerun those figures. So, um, you know, we, we probably don't want to jump the gun to avoid some of those counter pressures, but the arena figures absolutely have to be addressed once they're finalized um, because it's, it's going to be, if, if HCD is going to continue to be that forceful, I, I think we're going to see every housing element in California updated. And, um, uh, I, I wish I wish I had a, a better uh, answer. I, I think we're all struggling with that, and um, you know, it, 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 it would be the perfect time. Whereas I think a general plan update was classically when we would redo impact fee studies. I think the arena finalization is going to become another point where we redo all the studies. Sure, fair. Um, sort of in a similar vein. Um, ADUs, my understanding is that impact fees are generally waived to a certain point in mm -hmm. Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean that the impact fees are sort of offset to the other uses just by nature of what we're legally allowed to do? Yes, yeah, uh, a a ADUs is, is one of sort of those policy discussions that we used to see sort of in the, in the senior housing space and the below market space. Um, it, it, it's difficult. Uh, and so, yes, because they are relieved, it, it is essentially leakage out of the model and out of the fee structure that's not recovered. Um, I, I, you know, if we knew exactly how many ADUs were going to be built in a community, we could estimate and try to build into the mathematics. I don't think it would be significant enough that it would really adjust some of the, the bigger uh, line item figures at the end. Unless but, something like SB9 were to pass and then right. we, essentially this would all need to be reevaluated. Okay. Yes, yes. Just so, wanted to note that. Yeah, I mean, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll absolutely, you know, and, and, and uh, um, you know, I don't want to sound like a, 
you know, an, an ex lawyer who's like, oh, yeah, new legislation, let's redo the numbers. Yeah. Um, you know, but it, it is, there, there's, uh, there are those certain pressure points and uh, inflecting triggers, which uh, I think do require right now, most actually all communities have been managing their impact fee uh, application ADs through, through, through resolutions and ordinances, because it's, it's still such a small component of what's happening. Um. Sorry, trying to rip through these really quickly. Um, my other question is on uh, slide 16, just trying to understand the difference between um, Quimby and a park fee. Let's say a micro unit, 50 unit building. Um, if it was rental, if it was, um, sorry, if it was condo mapped, would it be subject to Quimby fees and park fees if it was a rental? I think it would be subject to the Mitigation Fee Act fee. Okay. I was just wondering if it was sort of like unintentionally incentivizing a certain type of development. Um, and then the last question is about the four-year tiered approach, um, because you've been working with so many other municipalities throughout the state. Is that four-year time frame something that you're seeing that's common, not just with this type of fee, but all fees? Um, or is there people looking toward, toward a longer horizon? No, it's, it's, it's a great question. I, I, I typically uh, uh, do three. Um, uh, the adjustment here uh, in absolute dollar figures, the way it sort of broke, I, I felt that it may be year one. Uh, modification uh, a bit jarring, um, especially to someone who's sort of mid process. So we extended it out to four, but I, I would usually, you know, 75% of the time do three and, and then occasionally as here do four with bigger absolute changes in absolute dollars. I, I, I've never particularly done longer than that just because um, I, I recommend updating it every, every five years. And there's also some reporting uh, that's required every five years. Uh, the city has to do an annual report for their impact fees, but every five years, there's a special report that has to be done where you sort of have to demonstrate that you were doing what you were supposed to be doing. And I think it's hard when the phase and period is the exact length of that, that reporting period. So we try to keep it less than that. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Um, Jeff, your hand is up now. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I, I, I certainly support the comments that Commissioner Rechtal made regarding the question about why the Palo Alto uh, valuation of land is, is so low. And, and, and put, to put it in context, why is the Palo Alto land valuation lower than Sunnyvale? And why is it not similar to Los Altos? Not knowing the exact specifics of the Sunnyvale fee, it's one of the few on the, the list that I didn't know. I think that they were uh, more aggressive and uh, wanted to push the envelope perhaps a bit more. Um, there is there is some play, you know, in in, in this data selection, um, and uh, you know, reasonable minds can differ. So, um, and, and, and it also is one of the more recent updates. But thanks, I don't know if if staff has any any comment. To, as to why that might be rational to consider with a better understanding of context or? Um, I, I actually, I do wanna jump in here. I have um, some notes in going through this process that the planning department also had um, their own internal uh, fee calculation, or sorry, fair market value land calculations that they also placed at around 5.5 um, to 5.6 million. So it's pretty aligned with what Nate has presented here and I'm, happy to follow up with planning to kind of get more info on how they uh, came to those calculations as well. I'm not sure if that helps this conversation a little bit. Okay, that's that's helpful to hear that the, the planning department has come up with it, but can you put it in context to, to help me understand why uh, Palo Alto's land valuation would be similar to Sunnyvale and uh, not similar to Los Altos? Yeah, I'm gonna um, I'm see if maybe Kristen or, or any other staff on this call have uh, some more context. I, I'm happy to try to pull the Sunnyvale fee program and evaluate it. Um, uh, there's yeah, you I, know, I, I, diff I, I, different consultants uh, sometimes uh, do different methodologies and sometimes they're charged with you know, being more aggressive than perhaps in other communities. That's uh, fine, I, I don't wanna get bogged down in this. Uh, next question, uh, I'm not seeing any data regarding the impact fees of neighboring cities. I'm seeing the impact fees of similar size cities to Palo Alto, which don't seem to be as contextually applicable. Uh, is this information that's available and would it 
will this be will this be provided to city council when the the matter goes to them um sure well which which uh cities would you guys like to add uh you could get, get a map and, and and draw a circle around us and, and let's look at it, it it seems like it'd be appropriate to understand los altos menlo park uh redwood city mountain, mountain view, view sunnyville okay. los yeah. altos hills okay uh, yeah. I mean, what, what, I, I think s staff could help you with that if, if you have further questions. Uh, the next question is, is, are, is there any way to differentiate between what we charge to commercial retail versus commercial office um, as we're looking to expand the, the impact fees that we're charging, particularly given the, the COVID impacts where everyone is dealing with right now, it, it seems like there would be a lot more reticence to uh, hit uh, retail development harder mm -hmm. uh, potentially than than, uh, than than commercial office. And and is that a distinction based on the way the city has things structured, or is that something that can change? It, it, it is something that can change, uh, and it's something that we could evaluate. Uh, the city has, has sort of used this structure previously, and so that sort of provides sort of the best process and sort of you know legal safeguard because is, is, you're sort of updating the rates more so than the, the non-residential structure but we, we, we could absolutely look at uh, bifurcating commercial uh, and provide some feedback on what that looks like okay and, and that that's that is a is that a question that's left to staff or to the council to uh, provide guidance on if, if it's and the reason i'm asking it is if it's if it's a, something that uh, council would dictate in policy then it could be something for the commission to consider as part of our recommendation. So once, uh, for instance, if this fee program were brought to council and council voted on it, we couldn't then, we couldn't then bifurcate it, it would have to be brought before. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but if, 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 if council or commission staff direct us to, we, we can take a look at it and provide feedback on, on what that might look like. Um, and if, you know, if, if folks liked what they saw, updating the report is not very difficult. Okay. And am I reading correctly, correctly that you're suggesting moving away from a tiered single and multifamily resident fee structure? Yeah, I, I am just because we sort of didn't feel that those uh, uh, square footage breaks reflected uh, the, the reality of the housing stock in in Palo Alto anymore. It's also something that I have not, uh, trying to find it, um, something I have not seen um, in many communities. And so um, it was uh, um, just sort of, you know, don't want to say it wasn't, it's not sort of industry standard right now, but um, uh, the, the distortion around 900 square feet on the multifamily, um, we, we felt was too great. Um, because the, the, you know, an 800 square foot apartment isn't sort of categorically that much different than a 950 square foot apartment. Perhaps on the single family side, you could see a little bit of a, a distinction there, uh, but uh, I, folks haven't done impact fees like this in, in quite some time. So we wanted to refresh that a little bit. Thanks, and does staff have any input regarding why the tier structure existed uh, to begin with uh, 20 years ago? And, and is, this, is staff recommending that we do away with that now? I don't have any background um, on why that existed. Um, I think we're sort of relying on our expert consultant to <laughs> advise us on this. And our, um, as Lindsay said, our planning department has been um, involved in this process and um, is what, as far as I know, has not um, objected to this change. Thanks. That's helpful. And, and last question, when looking at the uh, ramped up uh, schedule ramping from 25% to 100% over four years, I'm curious why your the, the first year fee would be 25% of the maximum instead of taking the difference between the current fee and the maximum and increasing uh, adding in 25% of the increase. And in fact, what it looks like is that the single family fee would, would actually go down in the first year. 
It would go down for the biggest homes, but for the that the the the, the medium sized tier, it would go up a little bit. That, that that's cer that's certainly a path. Um, you know, and if, and if if staff would like us to do that, we I, we had a very conversation last week. Um, whether you're sort of phasing in the delta, uh, I I felt that the 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 optics, if you will, I know folks don't like that term, but the optics for sort of the year one adjustment was a little cleaner. Uh, in this path, but I would be open. I, I really am pretty agnostic between the two. You get to the same point. Um, and uh, I think they're both defensible and, and both are utilized. I, I've done it both ways. Because that, that way you have a, a smooth and, and similar increase each year. Sure, Cer certainly, certainly. Okay, so, so that was a conscious decision to do that, but it's- It, 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 it was, um, you know, uh, uh, not, not, not every commissioner, not every council member is, is, is you know, is as profi as others. And so we were, I think, trying to, to provide a, a smooth adjustment and a smooth uh, 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 re refresh of the fee program. But we can definitely take a look at that and, and maybe provide, um, you know, what the tiered uh, alternative is. You know, as you mentioned, it's unbelievably easy to calculate. And, um, you know, staff, um, it doesn't need to be in the in the study either. It can just be something that's adopted by staff. So um, it, it would it, it would be very very easy, and we'll provide that. Um, thank you. Great. Okay, so um, I wanted to see if there were any um, members of the public who wanted to speak on this particular item. I don't see any hands, but um, just in case, Lam, do you see anybody who wanted to speak? Okay, it's not. Um, and then Council Member Ku, um, did you want to say anything about this item? No, thank you. Thank okay. you so much, Chair. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. Well, I, I'm listening to all of this and some of the questions that I had on my initial sheet um, have been answered. Um, I wanted to ask, given everything that's going on um, right now, is this the right time for the council to do this? Is it because we haven't done this for 20 years that you're recommending that it be done now? And how fast is the timeline? Because it feels like the commission has some not unanswered questions, but some thoughts about the valuations that uh, we'd like to get understood before we make a recommendation. Is that sort of the consensus of the council or, I mean, of the commission? I, I, I would like to note, um, it, it, it's, it's pretty proportional, um, the way the fee has been calculated. So I think a 20% increase in land value you would generally see a 20% increase in the fee. Just sort of demystify that so you guys could plug and play right there. Okay. Um, just wanted to mention that. So in terms of in terms of timing, any comments about that? Maybe um, Darren, you have a, a comment about the, the timing? No, I don't I don't have a comment. I, I mean this is a in action, so we want to get this correct motion tonight. So that that the timing is you've got to do something this evening because mm -hmm. this moves on very quickly. And, and I think the timing consideration is that this is already on council's agenda. Yes, well, that's that's why we're having this tonight instead of pushing it off like we wanted to do um, to next um, to March the March meeting um, or even April. So um, let's see if we can put together um, a motion. Um, to recommend this, and is there is it possible to put in the staff report that um, commissioners had questions, or do we not want to do that? Keith, I'm looking to you for thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I I don't think it's ready for prime time. Um, I will not be supporting this uh, report. I think there's too many holes in it. But I don't know what the other people think other commissioners. Okay, well, thank you for that, Jackie. Thoughts? Um, I think we received a lot of good feedback tonight. I'm curious whether there's room to um, make a recommendation on the report, but have some of that feedback incorporated for going to council, or if it's just sort of a take it or leave it right now. Yeah, I would look to Kirsten for the answer to that, but I think I know what it is. Kirsten? 
Sure. So you could, we can certainly um, add the outcome and summary of this meeting, including your comments to the staff report. We can certainly do that. Um, it, I just want to remind the commission, you probably know this, that this has already gone to the finance committee. Mm -hmm. um, it was that from that meeting, it was a recommendation to come to the Parks and Rec Commission. We recognize that that was probably in reverse order or that it was in reverse order. We should have come to the commission first and then finance committee, um, but that's the order we did it. Um, uh, so we can easily put in a summary of your comments into the staff report. And um, if you want to include something in the motion related to that. So for example, you could say, um, you know, you support the um, the report, you don't support the report um, and say why you don't or do, we could certainly, you could certainly add that into the motion. So whatever you want us to put in the staff report, we can certainly do that. Okay, that's, a, that's yeah, that sounds Kristen, fair. Excuse me, Kristen, real, real quick, could you uh, uh, clarify when, uh, when this report went to finance, when did finance approve this report? Um, it was, Lindsay, do you know the date? On it, was, that? it was December. Yeah, it was December 15th. Yeah, I mean, I just sort of feel like, you know, these uh, park impact fees have a direct bearing on the work that we're all trying to do. And if, uh, in reading the report today, I just had a lot of unanswered questions and I sort of felt like we're being a little bit rushed um, to get this done, understanding that it's already on the council agenda, it's already been approved by finance. And so it would be great if we could just, uh, if the rest of the commissioners agree and we can make a motion, if we could move to um, support the report, but um, also include our, our concerns about it. So would somebody like to make that motion? And Darren, can you put that up on the screen, do you think, so we can see it? Yes, bear with me just a moment. I mean, I think at the end of the day that um, I'd like to support this report, but I'd also like to um, outline uh, the concerns about that we talked about, about the valuation and are, are we asking for enough money? And then we would include would it we would we include the the concern or the the maybe the request to increase the land valuation and some of the other things that have been mentioned. Well, let's try then just to get a. Um, if we use this as a motion to get a second on this motion so we can discuss it. So, so I'm sorry, has someone made the motion already? No, Darren is just putting something on the screen for us to, to respond to. Maybe we don't even have anybody to make a motion. You know, while we're in this in this limbo place, I, I think I'm I'm siding with with Keith at this point. I I'm not 
seeing that uh, this is something that, that I would I would support without without more information, and I'm not exactly clear what the urgency is uh, for this to go to council and to get approved immediately. Uh, it sounds like it's been 20 years, uh, and it, it seems like it would be more appropriate uh, for us to be asking some questions to get vetted before it goes to council for, cons for consideration. Yeah, we just put wording in here that says this is uh, with the caveat that you look at increasing the the uh, valuation per acre and decreasing the square footage per employee, et cetera. Can we just say that? Yeah, I think that was what what our suggestion was that we that we could say that. Um, are, are those the only two things that um, we're objecting, not objecting to, but wanting more information about, or were there, were there others? I didn't write anything else down. And a three-year tiered fee instead of a four-year tiered fee. Uh, what else did we have, Keith? Well, I agree with Jeff's point about uh, moving the difference. It makes no sense to go backwards for the first year and then move forward. Uh, so I would want uh, three, you know, roughly three different spots. Um, but the big ones for me were the uh, square feet per employee and, and the land value. I, I think we may be doing the council a disservice by dropping this in their lap without the answers to the questions. That, that's part of the reason they have us do it is so the questions have been, um, this has been vetted and the big questions have been answered. And then they I can thought ask it was the, questions. I thought it was to spell out the questions and have staff go back and get them answered before it goes before the council. And I think it's a matter in that case of timing it, um, in terms of when this is scheduled to go to the council. So I think we're perfectly free, uh, Kirsten, as a commission to, to not recommend from our perspective that, that uh, this be recommended right now. I agree. And I, I think that if, if we don't recommend it, then that's, then that's something for city council to consider. If we're, rec if we're not recommending it because we're looking for more, for more information, uh, another item that, that I think is very important that wasn't mentioned was the splitting of the commercial uh, between retail and office. Uh, I, I think that's that's very important to get a better understanding of before this proceeds. So, um, Chair Cribs, could I uh, make a couple of comments, please? So, um, in response to Vice Chair Greenfield's comment about um, the why it needs to go to council is we want to, if this is going to move forward, we need to do it um, relatively soon so it can get into our formal budget process. If not, it won't be for another year. Um, and you can certainly make a motion to not recommend it. I, I think we would likely still go to council partly because this is um, considered a public hearing and as a public hearing when it goes to council it's a public hearing it has um, noticing requirements that um, have already begun mm -hmm. so because of that it would likely still go to council on March 8th but you can certainly um, not recommend that we move forward and delay this um, as part of your your motion I don't want to delay it I, I, because then we're saying we don't want an increase at all. And I don't want them to get that message. We do want an increase. So we need to move this needle forward somewhat. Yeah, I think David has a good point. I think we, we certainly want to see the fees brought up to where they, where they should be. We're just don't have the information to have um, to go ahead with it. Um, there are lots of unanswered questions, but I'm happy to just uh, uh, have somebody make a motion to um, recommend that we move uh, this forward. And then if uh, commissioners want to, we'll see how the vote goes. I'll make that motion. Was that Mandy? 
Uh, I'll make that motion. Thank you. And is there a second? I second. David? Okay, discussion? Can I verify that I've got the motion correct? Yes, I was going to ask you to do that. Thank you. Looks good. Okay. I thought we were going to add those other things at the bottom. I, I, I don't think that add, it dictating the land value increases. I think that a lot of it comes from the data that's supplied. If we want to give them information saying uh, additional um, information on neighboring or adjacent cities be added, that's fine. But I don't think increasing saying to increase land value, just to increase land value is the right direction I, I would want to include. So David, are you? Um, I guess I'm okay with it. So we're basically saying we want an increase and you figure out how much. Basically. You figure out how much between now and the time it goes to the city council, you figure out how much. We'll take anything you can give us. Well, I think uh, if we want to give them in, in from, or feedback on some of the comments that were mentioned, so we can yeah, do that. I'm, with, I'm open. I'm open to that to that sort of discussion. It just I think saying like raise it just to raise it is not necessarily the best message to send. So the feedback we're giving is outside of the motion. Um, the no, the minutes of this meeting are the feedback. I, I don't. Yes, I, I think that I think that's what we we mean that we would put the questions or comments in the staff report. Um. And okay. the motion, the motion would be separate instead of listing the concerns in the motion. Okay, then I'm fine. And if we could certainly, um, so the council staff report will be published on Thursday, so there may not be time for Nate to do some of this additional work for the staff report, but I'm, I think he could include it in the presentation to city council, so he we can say, you know, this was the Parks and Rec Commission's um, main point of concern. And I'm sorry, Nate, if I'm putting more work on you um, without talking to you first, but, um, and then you could include that, Nate, in your presentation to council, what the outcome of that was. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I'm, I'm happy to take these, I think these three main points of feedback and provide essentially maybe an alternative scenario before council and then we'll, you know, can be, uh, you add a slide addressing the, the, the tonight's meeting and, and and sort of show you know what some of those suggested arrows would do um we've done low medium and high kind of approaches before as well um you know it, it's it, i i the, the land valuation discussion we just have to discuss with staff because um uh, we can't raise it once we're already at council but um you know if we provide direction we can update that rather easily so um we, we can we can definitely address uh, tonight's questions uh, uh, before council in advance of, of that hopefully but it, it definitely uh, uh, in front of council on March eighth. Uh, I'm sorry. Could, could you please clarify that uh, regarding the, the land valuation? You're saying once this goes to council for consideration, the the land value number can't change, or it can't change after they uh, approve. Uh, approve them uh, right from a process perspective yeah the council would be voting on a nexus study and so you know it, it's very difficult and, and sort of inadvisable to change it that evening but it could certainly be rejected and we could come back with an updated report which is not cumbersome i don't want to suggest it's all that difficult to update but we would just uh i would probably need to get some direction from from Kristen and Lindsay and staff in the next couple of days on the that on the acreage component definitely that that, that is the, the the most significant piece Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and that clarifies how I will vote on this. I will, I will not be supporting this motion because I, I, I do agree with Keith that I'm concerned about uh, low, lowballing our max number and, and, uh, and limiting uh, the flexibility that the council has uh, to consider a higher figure in the, in the future, particularly but both now and however this number scales up over time. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, other comments from other commissioners before we vote on the motion? Okay, um, Catherine, could you do a roll call vote, please? Yes. 
Oh, let me see if Commissioner Koo has uh, any, uh, Council Member Koo has anything. No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Commissioner sure. Brown? Yes. Commissioner Cribbs? Yes. Commissioner Greenfield? No. Commissioner Lemaire? Yes. Commissioner Moss? Yes. Commissioner Olson? Yes. Commissioner Rectal? No. Five to pass to reject. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Nate and uh, Lindsay, uh, thank you very much for being here tonight. Um, Kirsten, do you have anything you want to add before we move on? Um, no, I don't think so. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Thanks, everybody, very much. Um, thank you so much. Feels like we should all get up and exercise and then sit down again. <laughs> um, but this will now move us. We're quite behind schedule. Um, so we have um, allocated 90 minutes for the Foothill Park discussion. And I, it's going to make it pretty late. So let's see if we can keep um, our comments. I want to make sure we get them all. But let's try to make sure that we keep them as, as pithy, as Darren says, as, as possible. Um, I wanted to just mention before we go to Darren that um, he will summarize the um, council's decisions last night. Um, but I also wanted for those of you who didn't listen to um, the meeting last night um, to say that the council was very appreciative of the commission's work and the ad hoc's work on uh, Foothill Park to date. and. Um, Everybody, I think, is understanding that um, this is a work in progress and that people are working very hard to make um, this whole thing work out. And I, for one, and I know everybody else really appreciates the work of the staff. So um, I'd like to turn it over um, to Darren now, and then um, we will go to the public after that and then back to the ad hoc and then to the um, commissioners for I'm, what I will sure be a very good discussion. So, Darren. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Great. Good evening, Darren Anderson, again with Community Services. This item is a discussion item. The commission will not take action or make a recommendation this evening. The commission does plan on taking action on this topic at the March 23rd meeting. Yesterday, February 22nd, City Council discussed Foothills Park and the recommendation that the commission had made at the special meeting on February 11th. Last night, City Council adopted an ordinance to change the name of Foothills Park to Foothills Nature Preserve. Council also adopted an emergency and regular ordinance to amend the municipal fee schedule to add an annual entrance fee for Foothills Park that includes the following. Fees for veterans, low-income visitors, student drivers, and persons with disabilities are waived. Although not part of the motion, uh, our attorney stated that it is reasonable to infer that the council meant to include active military in this list. Council also amended the municipal code to authorize the city manager to adjust the visitor limit from 300 people, 120 vehicles, not to exceed 650 people, 260 vehicles at any one time, and not to count persons with disabilities towards those attendance limits. Also part of the ordinance is that the following person shall not count towards that limit. That is visitors with reservations at Toll Camp, Oak Grove, and Interpretive Center, San city sanctioned recreation and educational groups, including city run summer camps, field trips, et cetera, group permit holders, uh, volunteers, and visiting, uh, excuse me, visitors uh, in a vehicle with a valid disabled person parking placard or license plate. This is a summary of the fees that are now in place. That's the $6 vehicle per day daily fee and free for city's designated volunteers volunteering that day in the preserve, active military, veterans, students with ID who are driving, and vehicles with disabled person placard or license plates. And then the annual pass with the $65 non-resident, $50 resident, and city employees. 
25% discount for seniors and free uh, annual pass for active military veterans and low income visitors. And just a reminder, the discount and free pass can be applied to both resident and non-resident. And I should note that the emergency ordinance again took effect immediately while the regular ordinance takes effect 31 days after the second reading or April 8th. The Foothills Park Ad Hoc Committee met multiple times in February to discuss Foothills Park policies. And the committee focused on providing feedback on this list of policies you see before you. Some of the policies appeared to the ad hoc as ones that are a little less complex and may not require as much commission discussion, such as the policy consideration about using the term vehicle entrance fee versus parking fee. While other policies such as the daily vehicle entrance fee and the discounts and waivers are associated with that are more complex and may require uh, significantly more commission discussion. I have slides for each of these policy considerations and as you discuss them, I can go to whatever slide uh, you would like, or we can go in the order in which you see them. Uh, with that, I'm gonna pause and turn it over to the chair and ad hoc and um, continue it to her she advises. Okay, I'm back. So, um, as everybody understands, we've had a very long list of things um, to discuss. And um, at one point, we thought a little bit about putting priorities on um, this list. I think given the way um, the meeting is going tonight that um, what I'd like to do is to have um, Darren go through um, the first slide Actually, no, sorry. Um, I'd like to have the ad hoc speak um, as Darren puts the slides up. And um, then we would um, kind of consider whether we can make a decision, um, an easy, not an easy decision, but is a decision um, right now, or this is something that needs to be put in maybe another bucket for later on. So let's try that with the first one and see how it works. Um, I don't, Darren, Given the fact we're doing it this, this particular way, um, should we go to members of the public now and then come back to the commission? Sure, I think that's fine, Chair, yes. And Lam, I don't see anybody who wants to speak, but. Excuse me, Chair, before we move on, move on I just have a question about what you just said. So we're gonna go through the list. We're gonna see if it's something we can agree on right now and then or if it should go in a, in a bucket for later consideration, would there be separate buckets for something the, to be the considered? The ones that there would be, a, the, the second bucket would be the ones that maybe we need more research, we need more information. And and, and is, is the second bucket items that we would not consider for the March uh, recommendation we make? Or? No, I, I would like to see if we could, if we could get the, the ones that are um, that we can develop consensus on um, tonight, and then perhaps get to the ones for March um, also in the second bucket, and the third would would be the things that we're pushing off to um, either uh, September or um, December. Great, great. I just want to clarify that because because I know that the the ad hoc did recommend that some of the things on this list not being. Uh, considered for March. So those would effectively go to the third bucket. Yeah, on. and the ad hoc also was was very interested in, in making sure that we had the flexibility to review the data that the data that's going to be coming in and there would be other decisions and there would be other things that um, are going to come up. This list obviously um, is not complete yet. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, so I don't see any members of the public wishing to speak. So Darren, let's go back to the daily vehicle entrance fee. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the ad hoc started by looking at different pricing options uh, for larger vehicles, in particular buses. And you can see before you the different methodologies and, and pricing structures that state parks and our two adjacent county parks chose for buses. Um, the ad hoc made the recommendation you see before you that the $6, which is already in place for the vehicles with up to nine, and then 30 for the small buses and 60 for the large buses, mirroring the California State Parks model. Okay. I agree. 
So um, let's see how this works. Let's go to either Jeff or Jackie on the ad hoc and see if you wanna add anything from the ad hoc's perspective or if this is um, what you want to express. Jeff? Uh, I don't have anything to add then to what is, is shown here. Or we thought it was uh, smart to mirror what the California State Parks does as we uh, discussed the tiered pricing structure. Jackie, thank you. Yep, same here. The only thing I would note is that we, we do call out later some of the, the waivers like the handicap placard mm -hmm. that are not part of this. So um, yeah, uh, I, I think this is what we all aligned on. Okay, um, Darren, let me ask just one thing. Um, is somebody um, and the staff taking um, any notes that need to be kept track of? I'm taking notes, yes. And doing everything else too. <laughs> Okay, um, other commissioners comments. I just have a couple questions. Um, overall, this looks good. I'm happy with it. Uh, there was some talk about whether we allow buses at all. D Darren, the council asked that. Um, is that something that we're going to debate? Is that what does staff feel about buses? Do you feel good about that or not? Yeah, very fair question. I was going to note that that did come up with council last night. And I, I think it is something we should debate. I think there are still a couple things outside of the considerations we've already looked at in this document or in this presentation that we'll still need to discuss. So that's one of them. And if, I think you're right that if you choose to ban a certain size or weight category of vehicle, that maybe it, it makes this unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the second question is, does this apply to people like, like school trips that make reservations? Or is this just for buses that show up our front door unannounced? Yeah, good question. You'll see one of the future recommendations from the ad hoc is that uh, school groups, permitted school groups uh, are not charged a fee. And we can get into more details on that at the subsequent slide. Okay. With those caveats, I'm happy with this then. Great. Um, other, David, you're you said you were good with all of this, right? Yep. Yep. Vice Chair, I I, I agree with with Keith. I, uh, hearing hearing from Council, the cons considerations or concerns that we should be looking into potentially limiting large vehicles. That, that I, I I I agree with the, the the general approach that the ad hoc has here, and and, and overall, I'm, uh, I I think the ad hoc's done a great job in, in preparing all of the all of the items in this report. Uh, so, so thank you. It gives us a great starting point for the discussion today. Um, I, I think we could, I, I would easily support the $6 vehicle uh, fee if, if we wanted to split this up off into two items or we had the daily, the, the, the basic daily entry fee uh, and that was approved today, like in, or that went into the bucket one. And then we had a, a separate bucket uh, for a large vehicle policy. Cause I think that's really what, what the consideration here is that we're, we're talking about what, what, what is the policy for large vehicles? Are we letting them in? And if we are, what is the, uh, the fee structure for them? Okay, thank you. Um, Mandy? Just a quick question. Darren, you said that Baylands has a policy for banning the vehicle limits at the council meeting last night. Would the small buses and large buses both not be allowed in, that, in this case of how this is written right now? Or is it just the large buses? I believe it would apply to the small buses as well. It was a fairly modest, and forgive me, I don't have it in front of me, but I want to say 10,000 pounds or something to that effect. And I believe that would apply to most of your small buses. Thank you. Darren, was there a conversation with the, the attorney's office or were you going to have one about um, the kinds of buses that, that would be able to come in? No, we haven't had that. And I think we could put disclaimers that you want either it's the size and less permitted or something to that effect i think we have some latitude or flexibility on that okay so the only the only discussion on this one i think everybody is has kind of agreed with this is that um we need to find out about the very large buses i think we're all in our mind thinking giant tour buses um with lots of people so that would be really helpful, Chair, to confirm this, exactly what kind of homework you want staff to do in this point about the large vehicles. 
So is it the intent to find a way to exclude um, buses over a certain size or weight and still allow in our permitted buses like school groups and that kind of thing? That would be my intention. Anybody have an objection to that? I agree with that. Okay, great. So I think we can move on to the next slide. Uh, one, one more Sorry. question and that uh, is okay. the huge uh, recreational vehicles, you know, vehicles that are as big as buses, but only have two people in them. Do we care? Uh, Do we care? I mean, they have to, you can't park just anywhere. You got to park at the very end and you're going to take up about three or four parking spaces. Um, do we, uh, uh, maybe this has nothing to do with this slide, but do we prohibit them? I don't know. Thank you for that, Commissioner Moss. I, I agree that if we're talking about it, it'd be good to have that clarity if that's where the commission wants to go. If RVs should be lumped in there, please let me know and I could do some research on how to make that happen. I, I, I agree with uh, with David's point. I think that'd be worth getting some staff uh, input yep. on. And, and Darren, I'm, I was also just in interested in a clarification. The current policy at the Baylands, you're limiting the um, medium and large buses, but are school bus field trip uh, buses permitted? They are. Mm -hmm. so, so, okay, so that's, that's really the type of uh, policy consideration that I think uh, uh, council was referencing uh, that I, I think we're, we're kind of articulating. So what I'm hearing is that already exists in the Bayland, in the Baylands. I, I would just say it's, it's not the most nuanced uh, policy that sign went in 25 years ago. And yeah, I think it would behoove us to think this through and have a, a well vetted and explained uh, process behind it. Whereas the Baylands I think is a, a little more opaque. And I, I will follow up on that. Great. If, just to clarify, Chair, if we end up going with the other route, do you still want the the small bus fee at all or for? I, I would still, I would prefer the small bus fee unless there's a big impact on staff then, Darren, but I okay. think, yeah. and. Okay, very good. And in addition to staff doing a little research on this and perhaps the ad hoc can meet again and digest this and work through it a little bit more to create a- But this is one of the ones that we would want to, we would want to have be in action um, as part of a motion for March. Yes. So we can mark that as such. Yes. Okay, good. Bear with me just a second. Okay. This slide was just to reiterate that the $6 fee applied to both residents and non-residents uh, to help make things a little faster. I don't think commission action is necessary on this since council has already made this uh, in effect, but perhaps uh, it's something you wanna discuss very briefly tonight. Yeah, I think it's worth a, a brief discussion. I'm certainly um, I'm in favor of supporting the fee, although in uh, my dream world, I would like us not to have a fee at all, um, but I don't believe that that's possible right now. So um, I support the $6 fee. Other commissioners, uh, let's go to the ad hoc. Sorry, Jackie. Yep, I think um, this is one where we thought this would be kind of um, the low end of what we could support, so. I'm curious to hear the other commissioner's reaction to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jeff? I have nothing else to add. Thank you. Um, other commissioners? Councilmember Member Koo. No comments, thank you. <laughs> thank you uh, very much. Jeff, well. Jeff, I have a quick comment Jeff had the comment. Oh, I, thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, I, I, I agree that uh, we, this is something we can support. I think, given that the action that council took yesterday to uh, offer free entry to a, a number of groups, it really kind of takes away the discussion 
about having the the, the, uh, the, the same fee ab ab apply at, at the entrance in that it, it's, it uh, impacts staff if they're looking at potentially charging different discounts or, or if we're offering different discounts for different groups for daily fee. Previously, we'd only considered it uh, for uh, the annual pass. And, and so given that, I, I think this makes sense to, to approve and, and, and see how things go and provide okay. some feedback uh, after in the summer uh, next time we get back to this. Thank you. Thank you. Good. And so, Chair, this one's, uh, un do I understand correctly, not an action item for our March meeting? I don't think so because it's already been decided, but I think we just wanted to make sure that count the uh, commissioners had an opportunity to weigh in. Very good. Would you like me to move forward? Yes, please. Great. Uh, so this is of the, the many discounts and options that the ad hoc had looked into was the free library pass idea. And the concept being there'd be a limited number available at Mitchell and Rinkin Yada Library. The starting for the conversation starter was five passes available at each library. And this would be a physical pass, at least in the beginning, the person could check out and post in their windshield when they come visit the preserve. And the idea being they could check it out for a few days and then return it shortly thereafter, like you would a, perhaps a video or something along those lines. I did have a conversation with the library staff who were very generous and eager to help and support with this. Uh, I should also note that the ad hoc was interested in ways to make this simpler and easier for folks to get, for example, the check it out online and print it at home. And I think that's certainly something we could look into. There's just a little bit of trying to figure out how we can make sure that wouldn't be easily copied and maybe um, used inappropriately. Okay, thank you, Darren. Um, Jackie? Yep, so I um, am very much in support of using our libraries in this way and um, having um, a, a way for people to, you know, sort of wait and um, have a, a way to come to the park for free. Um, but also, I think it's a great way to engage more people with libraries. Thank you. Jeff? Yeah, I agree with Commissioner Olson, who uh, brought up this idea. I think it's a wonderful idea and, and a way to engage uh, more citizens and, and allow more access uh, to our parks. Yeah, I'm just very grateful to the library staff, too, for being willing to take this on. I think I think that's great. So it's, it's wonderful. Um, other commissioners comments? Jeff, you have your hand up. Sorry, that's because I never lowered it. Oh, well, at uh, least it works now. Okay, yeah, there, thank you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm generally in, in favor of, of this idea. I, so just trying to understand that the library, this has been fully vetted with the library staff and uh, staff believe this is a, a workable so solution or is there is there any more to discussion, re research that, that, that is required on this to, before we, before staff would be comfortable moving forward with this. Yeah, thanks, Vice Chair. I think so. It was a, a very brief conversation with the library staff. And, a, and a, as I mentioned, a general willingness to help make this successful in any way. But the fine details have yet to be worked out. Uh, and I'm glad to take any notes you've got, the commission has on this in terms of number of days, how long the checkout would be, details like that. And a lot of it, I'd be looking for guidance from the library staff on what's effective from their perspective as well. As, as yours. I'm in favor. So does that suggest that we, sh we should uh, discuss this item a little bit further on th at the next meeting to clarify some of the details or is that something that uh, would, would be best left to staff? Well, if I can take your, your feedback tonight and try to work those things out with the ranger staff, the librarians, uh, that would be really helpful. And I think, yes, it would be an actionable and hopefully a brief discussion at the 23rd. Great, thank you. Yeah, especially with COVID, I'm worried about the librarians having a lot to deal with right now. And do we want, even if we like this, do we want to delay it for two or three months and let the libraries ramp up being back to normal? So it'd be one question. I just don't, if the librarians are happy doing this, then go ahead. 
Mm -hmm. But I do think we need some more talk about duration. So I agree with Jeff that we should postpone the, the official um, endorsement until if we talked about it. So you're suggesting to postpone it maybe until this summer and maybe until um, COVID gets a little bit uh, more understandable? Or? I would want to give the librarians that option. Yeah. And if they think that would be a good thing, then I would think that's a good thing. If they are not bothered by this, then, then we don't have to wait. But I do think we should talk about this more. You know, like, for example, do they have to return it within 24 hours, 48 hours, one week? What's we should talk about that because there's pros and cons to that. Okay. And uh, Commissioner Rectal, if possible, some of that feedback would be really welcome tonight if you wouldn't mind sharing some additional thoughts on what would be perhaps ideal in, in your perspective. Okay. The trade off is that if you let them have it for a whole week, since there's a limited number of passes, then less people can use it. But if you make it too short, then they may actually have to take an extra drive over to the library and return it. And so giving them, let's say 48 hours to return it allows them to um, make another trip to the library and kill two birds with one stone. So both from a traffic standpoint and also from a convenience standpoint, having a you know, medium like a two day checkout seems reasonable. But I could be convinced other ways. That's just my off the cuff response. Um, Darren, my recommendation along those lines is that maybe this is a piece of paper that has a, an effective date and an expiration date, and you could adjust it to, you know, say three days and, and it expires uh, right there on the piece of paper or a, Q, a QR code or something like that, that uh, basically automatically expires in three days. That way there's not all this passing of paper and you could even do it possibly online. Um, that would be my only suggestion. Otherwise, I think it's a terrific idea and we should do it as soon as possible. Thank you, Commissioner Moss. I'm glad to discuss that with the librarians and pick their brains on how to do. I guess that's sort of in keeping with the ad hoc's hope that ultimately it could be check out online, print it at home, bring it in and short term. Um, so I'll, I'll talk that over with the librarians too to see how we might make something like that work. Just a quick question for the ad hoc. Were you envisioning that this would be a multi-day pass or it would be a pass that would just be used for one day? Um, I envision it being a pass just used for one day. So I don't think I wouldn't envision needing like a lengthy term on it, but maybe one overnight in case they can't get back um, to the library to return it. Thank you. So, so given that it's, it's a, a single day pass uh, and also uh, uh, taking into consideration Keith and David's feedback, especially regarding COVID, it seems like we don't, maybe the idea of a laminated pass that has to get returned is a bad idea, particularly given COVID where the libraries have a, a 72 hour policy where you, re you return a book and it, it sits in a, in a holding uh, location uh, for a period of time. So it seems like maybe uh, if we were, able, we were able to authorize libraries to print to print out passes for five for each day, and it was and the date was included on it, uh, that that would be better. Then then it wouldn't have to be returned. But then that increases the complication that they have to have these passes printed out. So anyway, th things for staff can, to consider. Uh, but if, it, if it's not possible to, if, if we have to use a laminated pass, we might want to consider doing this post COVID. I actually think a laminate would be fine because just like a credit card, you could put uh, sanitary, uh, sanitation, uh, uh, the uh, goop, this, the, um, the hand alcohol. sanitizer, hand sanitizer, just wipe it off, just like you would a credit card. It's not the same as a book. A book, you can't do that too, but uh, a laminated thing you could. So keep that as an option. Okay, so this then rests with um, Darren, with the staff and the, and the librarians to figure out uh, the details. So this gives you enough to talk so. with them about, okay. Yeah, I think so, thanks. And hopefully we get the answers and we can include that in the um, March. 
yes. suggestions. Okay. Uh, this next one that the ad hoc had supported was limited free pass, excuse me, limited free entry days. And this was modeled off the national park standard where they have six free entry days. Uh, the days you see before you were my suggestions. So if you don't like them, please blame me. I was trying to find a way to offer different days of the week, one holiday, one weekend day, and avoid some of the peak days of summer where there might be a concern that you're coming on a day where you're going to get turned away because the crowds are so uh, such high uh, visitation levels. And I could share if you like, I don't have it on the screen, but the national park days were mainly oriented around holidays. So in addition to MLK Day, they had the first day of National Park Week, the one year anniversary of the Great American Outdoors Act, um, National Park Service Birthday and Veterans Day. What about, so Earth, was, what about Earth was, Day? This was a really fun one to put together um, and, and to discuss. So um, Jeff, you wanna uh, comment and then Jackie, and then we'll open it up to the commission because I'm sure there'll be some great ideas. Yeah, uh, just we all thought this was a great idea to um, encourage people to the park and, and allow them to come in um, for free. And, you know, hopefully it, it reaches people who, who can get there on different days. We thought it was uh, nice of Darren to think of different days that people might have off and also include um, a holiday as well. Um, certainly realizing that park visitation may be high or people may be turned away, but um, we thought this was uh, a great idea to incorporate. Thank you, Jackie. Yep, same here. Um, I think my main concerns were having a, a holiday, um, a popular holiday at least, like our, um, you know, New Year's, et cetera, and, and having overcrowding at the park. But I think MLK Day um, being in January, that that um, takes some of that concern off. But I'm happy to hear other thoughts from our commission. Great, thank you very much. I, I thought Darren did a really good job of um, going through the calendar and staying away from um, some typically um, well-traveled days in um, the summer and in the fall. So I thought, <laughs> thought it, was a, it was really, it was good, good work. Other commissioners? This is great. I, you know, when you go to the De Young, it's always the first Thursday of the month or something like that. But uh, I think this is much more equitable. I do wonder, though, whether we should at least have one in the summer. I know it's going to be the chance of them being turned away. But again, if this is for equitability, then we're kind of banishing them to the, the season where they have school. So if you for school kids, the only one they really could go for is the Saturday and the MLK. And do we want to move one of these into, let's say, June, so that you at least have one shot of going to, uh, outside of school days? That's a good point, Keith. Yeah, I would support that. I, 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 agree, with, I agree with Keith. That the related cons concern I have is that it's six months in a row. And so if somebody comes around to June and they, the only way they're gonna get in the park is on a free day, they've got to wait six months at least. So I'd, I'd look to stagger them a little bit more, like maybe drop the February and the April ones or fe February and May to have a, a summer weekday and also a, a weekday sometime in uh, October, November. But, but, but overall, I, I really like the uh, approach. I think six number six days is, is great. The, the fact that we're modeling after national parks, that, that's, that's great. I, I really like the, the uh, sentiment. So Darren, if you look at the historical visitation, is it, it, does it match up with schools or is it match up with seasons? The season is always the highest for the, the summer being the peak and then spring and fall sort of starts to taper off with the lowest in the winter. So if you're going to add some outside of school days, but you don't want to hit high visitation days, are we better going, let's say, in June to get the spring after school's done, 
or do it before they go back to school. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, both are viable and legitimate. And I could see a lot of value in having a day in June too, where the weather is so nice. Maybe we should just add a day um, so that so. it can, and just add the first something in June and have seven days instead of six. Cool. I, like, I like the continuity of it going every, um, starting in December and going through June. School doesn't end until like June 15th. Uh -huh. I, I don't understand why we would leave October and November uh, out just 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 to have such a long gap between whatever we're doing in the in the first Saturday of December. I I, I, I appreciate the the eloquence of, of how it's set up now every month and it's it's rotating days, uh, but but I don't it doesn't strike me that that's the most equitable and and practical overall for the people who want to take advantage of these days. The other thing that we could do is to leave the days the way they are right now. And then as we re revisit this in um, August, um, if it's been very successful, start some new days in the fall. And if not, um, just leave it be. Well, you're going to miss the summer then. So maybe the 1st of August, just before they go back to school. Uh, and then we can worry about the fall later. So just one one bit would be helpful that idea of staggering um, and spreading them out a little more right now we've got it in the consecutive ones if you think it would be we'd be better served staggering them every other month um, is that something you'd like me to pursue yeah why don't you go ahead and do that Darren okay what about the ad hoc what do you think I'm not opposed to that and I'm actually not opposed to adding uh, more than six for yeah. the entire year. Same here. So would we like to add a day? I mean, a, a day per month for the year? I think my preference would be let's start slow and start with six. And if it works out really well, then I, we can add one. Um, or maybe I guess we have seven days of the week. Maybe add a Sunday. We have seven days. Perhaps we add one for the summer that then, um, you know, allows us to revisit this after that one that would already be added for the summer. Mm -hmm. are, are we trying to wrap up discussion on this item? Yes. Tonight or? We are. Okay. I didn't, didn't know. Because it's a fun item and I'm sure yeah. we can reach consensus very soon and then we'll mm -hmm. have this done. And, it, and it's a great thing to announce too. I don't see the magic with six. I think you could add a seventh one, maybe in August, early August. I don't, I don't see what's so special about six. Let's, let's add a seventh one in June. And then school goes back really early, like the 15th of August for elementary school kids in Palo Alto. Yep. And was there, uh, forgive me, I might have missed this. The beginning of June, they're not out of school in some places, and so we might not want um, the first of June. Is that did I hear that correctly? Yeah, some are out of school. As some schools are out really early around here, and some of them go through the end of June. So you just, it's hard to know. Okay, or we could hit that one be a Sunday, and that way. Yeah, make it a Sunday. Okay. Or later June might be, might be better to avoid uh, graduation type conflicts. And Father's Day. Yeah, don't put it on a Sunday in June on Father's Day, dear. <laughs> <laughs> there was some discussion amongst my staff of just having some simplicity so people could know, okay, the first of these months, it's easy to sort of remember or put on your calendar yeah. as it starts to be moving days and... Um, it, it can be a little more challenging for folks to remember. Then maybe choose then maybe choose August and avoid June. Okay. Throw it to August. I don't. I'm... 
And if we're adding a Sunday, do we really want to be adding a Sunday during the summer? I, no. I, I thought the consideration for a summer would be a weekday. Yeah, kids are out and also there's less competition. Uh, so, okay, so perhaps the Sunday is on a, a different um, time of year than like the December. Okay. Could I suggest that Darren takes our feedback and, and works with the ad hoc to, to put together Thank you. a, a, a sure. list of first to approve next week? Yeah. Next, next week. yeah, that would be great. Terrific. Yes, but with the goal of being able to recommend this um, in March. Yes. Absolutely. And when I was asking if you were trying to make a decision, I meant, are you trying to make a final decision tonight versus uh, uh, ne next month? I knew what you meant. Uh, this can, I, can I just make, sorry, can I just make one comment Absolutely. about, maybe not for this first iteration of it, but if we do go to expand future days, um, beyond six or beyond even seven, um, maybe picking a specific like calendar date, like a t the 23rd or the 24th mm -hmm. and looking at where it doesn't fall in the summer and not saying, all right, this is the date for the entire year. Because I think what I heard from the council last night was that they wanted it as, as simple as possible, uh, mm -hmm. unless things for the public to remember. Um, the 23rd just happens to be the date Powell was incorporated. So that could just be like, an easy one to start off with um, the right. date they celebrate it. I had debated that too, uh, Chris, around of having, because that's the model uh, National Parks uses. The only challenge is, of course, it's moving all the time, and then you don't have equity amongst the days of the week staying consistent um, and potentially falling a lot on, on weekends. But maybe that's just not a big concern. It doesn't matter. And maybe it's not the same year to year. It's like you, at least you have one date to message for the entire year. It's that there's a little bit of clarification. Yeah. Um, and you can ramp up the communications toward the end. It's just another thought that maybe the ad hoc can, can discuss. Yeah. And that, again, is how National Parks does it. They'll issue, I think, every year the new list, um, as you noted. Very good. And, and, and maybe, the, maybe the day of the week you pick is the day that MLK Day falls on that year. So, so that you still have the, the holiday included. Okay. Great. Any other feedback on this item? All right. The ad hoc, as I think the whole commission knew, was interested in pursuing this and recommended uh, free daily passes. Council's already addressed this. I don't believe there's need to go into this any further. Chair, mm -hmm. do you agree? No, I think I think we're good on this one. Okay. Uh, pedestrians and bicycles. The ad hoc believe making free daily passes for pedestrians and bicyclists would help make the entrance process a little bit smoother. There is a concern, a very real concern about whether this would add to problems with people parking outside and trying to walk into the, uh, the preserve, which you, you've heard tonight, we're having some issues with mm -hmm. that at Alexis Drive. Um, most regional parks aren't charging for pedestrian and, and pedestrian and bicycle entrance. Uh, there is a, an element of it being impractical to collect fees from pedestrian and bikes, especially the ones coming in from other gates. Um, impossible at the other gates, challenging at the main gate, but, but it is possible. Great, thank you, Jackie. You wanna to speak to this one? Yep, um, I am supportive of staff's view here um, and prefer to prioritize safety on this one. Jeff? Yeah, no, no, no additional comments. Okay, well, um, and I certainly support um, having the uh, bikes and pedestrians um, without um, an entry fee. I'm hopeful, I'm not so sure that we can resolve this uh, next time because I think that there still needs to be just some, some discussion sort of outside what we um, have to opine on, and that's um, understanding what um, what other city staff like um, traffic enforcement and parking and all of that can do to help out some of the complaints than the comments that we're hearing both from Los Altos Hills and for neighbors on Alexis Drive and other places to uh, mitigate their parking. So 
um, be interested in thoughts on that, Darren. And I don't know whether that needs to be part of this or not. Um, maybe it's just enough to say that we support daily entry for pedestrian and bicycles. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just on the comment of the, uh, how to address those those other problem areas, Alexis Drive, Los Altos okay. Hills, side streets. It's complex and I don't have a solution yet. We're in communication with yep. Los Altos Hills staff. Um, we're just starting conversations with our transportation team to get them more involved in helping us figure out the best ways to uh, address those. I also need to meet with and talk to the, the folks at Alexis Drive to figure out their thoughts on how to best manage that. Yeah, if there's some sort of a parking sticker that they get and then you ticket the every place else, but sort of that's not what we do. So we'll leave that to you, but I think it, I think it is a big, it's a big concern. Um, do we know if um, any law enforcement is ticketing uh, on Page Mill Road? Yes, well. I believe, uh, I heard from Los Altos Hills that they have requested extra service in their areas around Altamont. And uh -huh. so I know the Sheriff's Office was issuing some citations. The Rangers haven't had as many problems on Page Mill Road uh, with the illegal parking. It seems that the majority of it seems to be either drop off and walking from a little further away. Um, but Los Altos Hills did say there were people parking in front of driveways. One person had to get towed. Uh, so it is problematic. But are they parking in front of Los Altos Hills driveways? Yes. So why would their lot, do they have, are they sheriff law enforcement? That's or? right. Yes. So do we know that they're ticketing? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I guess what I'm saying is it hasn't solved all the problems. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it hasn't. Okay. Um, other commissioners? Yeah. I think we're going to keep our eyes on this. I don't think there's anything we can do now, but if there are problems down the road, we can address it then. Yeah. I'm sure we're going to be hearing about them on a continual basis, which is good. We want to, you know, we want to know that. Yeah, I can see the creative people getting Uber rides up there then uh, because of lack of, of, uh, of internet access, not being able to get an Uber back. <laughs> but anyway, being able to get up there with an Uber or um, the only other thing is whether this uh, Palo Alto would like to start a shuttle service uh, where you Pick up, you park down at the bottom of the hill and you pick up a bus, get on a little shuttle bus and get driven up to the top there. And the shuttle bus runs, you know, back and forth all, all day on Saturday and Sunday. Is that, that, is that a business we want to be in? That sounds like to me something for a later on discussion. One, one other thought, uh, Chair, that I had was, is this not necessarily a uh, something impacted by fees, but rather... Uh, something that might happen if the park is full more often, where then people are looking for ways into the park because it, mm. the because they can't go through the front entrance, as opposed to um, something that would happen if they're trying to avoid the, the fee. Yeah, so as Keith says, we'll just need to keep track of all of that. Just to clarify, in my experience in, in working for state parks, various municipal parks and county parks is, yes, people will on both accounts. When there's a fee, they're going to park outside and try to walk in for free where they can. And likewise, when it's full, there's, they'll look for those alternative entry points. I, I think this item's a, a perfect third bucket item. It's something to keep on the list of, of things to consider. and. It seems like we're kind of digressing into uh, entry point consideration discussions, uh, which will come later. Yeah, yeah. And and and, and really, I don't know if it's better to, to, to consider an entry point considerations, uh, but I, I think it it does beg the question to clarify that we review the bike policy and clarify the bike policy. That I mean, not not a lot of people understand or are aware of that you're not allowed to ride a bike between foothills. Uh, nature preserve, as it will soon be known, and Arastadero preserve, and the, and the reasoning for that. So I, I think that's something that we ought to address uh, to, to, to discuss. Okay. Um, I agree that this is something that we should monitor, but as we're getting feedback from the public, I think that there should be a clear direction or phone number or a form for folks to be able to provide feedback in one place, because I feel like some of it's going to go to 
different public safety agencies. And so if there is a way to consolidate all that feedback, so we make sure we're getting that as a clear picture to consider moving forward, that'd be helpful or to invite them um, to come and give us feedback at a future meeting as well. Very good. I'll, I'll spread that with the Los Santos Hill staff and suggest, because I know they are receiving calls from their community and invite them to write and attend meetings with the PRC um, as well as passing on any information I get from my staff and other agencies as well. And, and just one quick question, Darren, re regarding Alexis Drive, it is, has the transportation department been, been notified of the potential for uh, increased uh, cars parking there when we start implementing the entry fee? And, and is that something that the transportation department would be working on as opposed to community services? I think it'll be collaborative. And yes, I, I have emailed uh, transportation staff with the, the complete list of all the things we're looking at. So that's inside the park issues with, are we, do we have enough ADA parking? Do we need speed bumps? The outside the park elements where, is there a crosswalk that's needed on Page Mill? Do we have the right no parking areas? Um, and how do we address people parking where they shouldn't? Sounds like I opened a box. <laughs> yep, a whole lot of stuff. Yep. What would be helpful, Chair, is to understand if this pedestrian and bike free thing is an actionable item for our March 23rd, or is this not? Yeah, I was just going to say, so here, where we are with this, because I think the intention is that uh, pedestrians and bicycles are free now. And yet we want to be <laughs> concerned with uh, unintended consequences and review this as we go into the fall and December. Jeff and Jackie, is, is that what you're thinking too when we discussed it? Yeah, I was, I was thinking uh, that we have that, what we had written and, and have it free and we monitor and you know a lot of these things may need to be revisited yep. that we that we have as we gather more data. Good, thank you, me too. Jackie? Yep, I agree. Okay, Darren, does that provide what you need? Almost, so is that part of, <laughs> is that part of our action on, on the March meeting as yeah. affirming this or are you saying it, you don't wanna address it yet? No, I would like to have it be part of our action and um, if others, I mean, if, if the motion doesn't pass, it doesn't pass, but I'd like to have it part of the action and I'd like to have the flexibility to um, make changes as we go through the year. But I don't wanna, I don't wanna start in with a fee for bikes and peds and how are we gonna count them and all of that right now. I'd like to have them free and see how it works out. So I have a quick question regarding that. Uh, I, I support what, what, what everyone is saying and, and I'm just, and they're trying to understand procedurally, this is kind of a, a passive action. Uh, so are we, are we, I think uh, Darren's asking, do we want to include this as part of the motion, even though we're not going to be recommending any, any change as a result of this? And, and th this sounds uh, very similar to the, the previous item regarding the $6 entry fee for residents and non-residents, where you're suggesting that you wouldn't want to include that as part of the action. It, it seems like we, we should be doing the same uh, thing for what I was referring to as passive actions or or, or, or whatever the, a better way of, of phrasing them is. And chair um, and vice chair, one option could be it gets summarized in the body of a staff report as opposed to uh, part of a motion. Okay. That's a good I, I prefer this not to be a motion just to keep it simple. We have so many other aspects of it. The more we throw in, the, the harder it's going to see to, to pass that find, motion. Yeah, find the needle in the haystack. Okay, that's fine with me. Darren, got it. Yep, just got it. Okay, my notes. Uh, so school field trips. Um, the ad hoc had discussed this and wanted to make sure we were providing opportunities for students. And this was the 
the methodology that we thought made the most sense is to allow them in via um, the permitted school trips for free. And now council has taken the separate action for students driving into the preserve. Um, but just to reiterate, let's see, let me grab just a little bit of extra data. This had not yet been shared with the ad hoc, but there was a couple of questions we asked, how would we run a reservation system like this? And the JMZ staff very graciously said they'd be happy to handle reservations for all school Great. field trips, um, be they guided and programmed like the one that JMZ currently offers or self-guided. Um, so they would help with this, that element. They also said that they, in their opinion, was that waiving the fee for a school already participating in a programmed field trip made a lot of sense, but they were open otherwise, meaning schools that hadn't paid for or part of um, a permitted uh, program would pay uh, an admission fee, uh, perhaps at a reduced rate. And they also suggested maybe waiving the admission fees for Title I schools. Uh, they also agreed on, on keeping this to weekday only, which has mm -hmm. been the case, but for, it would bear clarifying, which um, I don't believe we've got that captured anywhere. Great. Oh, uh, I, like, I like all of that. That's great. Um, Jeff? Well, I, I agree with those recommendations. And um, I just think it's important to remember how this all started. I, I mentioned this, I think, uh, last meeting in terms of the pilot proposal and trying to get more kids into the park and more schools. And, and so I think uh, this is great and would certainly rely on the expertise of the JMZ who, are, who have done this and what their recommendations are as they have seen what works. Um, and particularly, particularly uh, um, favor waiving the fees for Title I schools. Great, Jackie? Yep, um, I, I agree with that. I have a question on the recommendation. Are, are they suggesting that school trips um, be charged a fee if they didn't previously have a permit or some other fee, Darren? Yes, that right. is. So the, if they were already participating in a, in a programmed field trip, yes, but otherwise that school should pay the admission fee, um, perhaps at a reduced rate was their recommendation. So this would be the self-serve uh, models where a school just wants to come up and they're, they're not paying for the JMZ or part of some subsidized program the JMZ has. So even if they notify us in advance and request a permit? That's their suggestion, the JMZ staff. I realize that is different from what the ad hoc had discussed where we just said, let's just make it simple and any any permitted school group that comes in, meaning they make the reservation with the JMZ, whether they're part of a program or not would be in free was the, was the ad hoc recommendation. Mm -hmm. I had just gotten this feedback from the JMZ staff and wanted to share it with you. Yeah. Let me play devil's advocate. I mean, being against school kids seeing the park is kind of like being against puppies or being against apple pie, <laughs> right? But there's a reason we're charging this fee. It's because we need the money. The park has a lot of costs associated with it. And you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We have all these good intentions about giving a break to here and a break there. And at the end, we may actually end up with such little um, fees that it's not worth the hassle for collecting the fees because we've given so many breaks to people. So that's one thing I'd be worried about. Other thoughts? I'm, I'm just trying to understand that the JMZ is suggesting that uh, in, in general, that not all school bus permits would be free. Right. And, and on, a, on a broader scale, are we, it seems like we need to have a policy in place with, with, with staff's input, of course, on what the limit, how many school bus field trip permits we permit each day Today. and and beyond that uh, we really don't want to see buses coming in i i guess we, we wouldn't be able to inhibit school groups coming in 
in a combination of private vehicles, uh, but it seems like you want to be you want to avoid getting overloaded with the, with the school groups for both the for both staff sanity and for the environmental uh, side of things as well. Well, we talked about it at the ad hoc though. It seems like we had a number that there was a number of permits a day that were issued, Darren. No, not that there are an, a fixed number because it's highly variable depending on what they want to do and how many are in the group. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that there's control mechanisms where staff is looking at a permit request, understanding okay. what they propose to do and where and what time and can say, oh, you're looking for a Friday at, in the afternoon. That's a very busy time. Here's what's available. That's not available. So that kind of adjustment based on Ranger and, and eventually JMZ staff would certainly be in play. So, so it sounds like staff needs to work with the ad hoc to come back with a recommendation on this first to try and get in our, our March recommendation. Is that right? Yeah, we could do that. And is there more input you need, Darren? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. It's um, There are a lot of nuances depending on the size of the groups that make it difficult to wrap up into a neat uh, policy package. I wonder if there's an element where some degree staff discretion on the number of um, school trips could be managed that way as opposed to trying to craft something now. Um, I'm glad to try and work with JMZ and the ad hoc. Well, let's, let's, I, I think this is an important one for us to decide in March. Let's uh, go back to the ad hoc and we'll have a, the discussion about it and see if we can get a little bit more information since we're just learning about the JMZ and come to a conclusion that we would present in the March meeting. Yep, and I in particular would like to know why they would recommend um, imposing a fee on school trips. Um, that are yeah. outside of the parameters that they are suggesting. And also whether there would be any markup to the schools for running their reservation through JMZ. I, yeah, I think the, the question to the last part is no, they wouldn't. Me meaning just to go through the reservation system and get booked into a time slot. No, they, they wouldn't be a, a markup or a fee there. I think they were only proposing some, some entry fee if you're not Title I and you're not going through a paid program, albeit a reduced one. And they, they didn't provide details on that, but certainly we can discuss this with the ad hoc and involve someone from the JMZ, pick their brains and, and work through that, uh, that issue. That'd be great. Do you envision that the JMZ's role will be changing at all re with respect to field trips? I don't know that for sure. I'd have to converse with their staff, but glad to, to bring that up. I, one new part is obviously in the past they would be scheduling their own trips and this would be a little different where other other schools now could come to them and they'd be sort of just playing that role of squeezing them in and, and managing the reservation system so to that degree it would be new okay Darren, can we move on and can you tell me how many more slides there are? It's 10 o'clock right now. Um, and I'd like to see how much more we can get through tonight before we really tire everybody out. Um, and I'd also like to make sure that we can discuss the ad hoc committee assignments and take action on that tonight um, so that we don't have to do it at the retreat. Yes, I, I, in addition to the one you see before you, visitor capacity, we've got the online reservation system, the hillside barbecue reductions, the dog policy, the photography and videography policy, the group permit policy and Oak Grove picnic policy, and uh, the environmental monitoring data collection. And lastly, the uh, vehicle versus parking fee terminology. Okay, well, I think a few of those we can knock out pretty quickly. Um, yeah. And then some of them push over because some of them aren't meant to be reviewed until even the winter time. So shall we, are you, is everybody okay to proceed for a little bit longer? Yep, okay. Sure, and maybe anything that's not simple, we can just agree that we'll have the discussion uh, 
at the next meeting for, for the items that we're aiming for in March, just to move things along more quickly. Right. Okay. Very good. Uh, so this was just about not counting the pedestrians and bicyclists uh, towards the visitor capacity limit. The Idaho had noted that pedestrians and bicyclists don't have as significant an impact on the preserve as vehicles do. Uh, they also noted that there's no accurate way of knowing or controlling how many pedestrians are entering Foothills Park, given that pedestrians are allowed to enter the Foothills via the Beta Ridge Trail through Pearson Rastrodero Preserve and Los Trancos Open Space Preserve. Jackie or Jeff, any comments? I think that was a great summary. Nothing, Nothing else. Nothing additional. Great, thank you. Other comments? I'm okay with this. I, I agree with this. I think this is it fits in with a group of things uh, that we're listing at the bottom and not including in the motion. I, in practice, I agree. In theory, I don't. If we had 500 pedestrians walk in, we should be able to close the park. And if we don't count towards the visitor capacity limit, the staff doesn't have any way of closing it unless we have enough cars in there. So again, to give the, the staff enough flexibility, I think in, in theory, uh, we should count both. In practice, I don't think they're gonna have 500 people going through, but I think it's just, we shouldn't uh, paint ourselves in the corner. Okay. We can count them, but not count it toward uh, well, it, we can count them, but not count them in the same way. And I think that this is a sort of a, uh, a moot point for now. We don't have this a huge number of pedestrians and bicyclists. So can we revisit this later in the year? Yeah, I think that we look at it when we make our report back to council and see how, how we've done with it. Because you're right, Keith, we might have 5,500 people walking in someday. Yeah, not likely for now. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Darren, do you have enough? I think so. Okay, great. Let's go to the next one. Very good. Uh, the Ad Hoc Committee discussed some of the merits and challenges with the reservation system for vehicle entrance uh, to Foothills. There's concern that a reservation uh, requirement may limit visitation unnecessarily, especially, especially for people with limited online access. The ad hoc committee recommends that staff continue to investigate options for how a reservation system might work for Foothills Park, but not implement one at this time. And they, they recommend discussing reservation system again towards the end of the calendar year 2021. Jackie or Jeff, any additional thoughts? Nope. Nothing additional. Okay. Um, for me, I'd, I'd certainly uh, like to push it off um, and, and discuss it uh, at the end of the year. Other commissioners? I don't yeah. think we have enough information to c consider making a recommendation on this a, a month from now. Um, no. I, I don't know that we're ne necessarily talking about the end of the year. It could be late, later in the year, but this one actually might be into the year so third bucket yes yep third bucket yep yeah I, I would i would love a reservation system as soon as possible for like 50 to 75 reservations per day or or maybe even less um but i it's impractical for right now until we can investigate options so keep working on those options Thank I you, agree David. with everybody. I think we do need more information, but I strongly support the idea of a reservation system um, and look forward to discussing it moving forward. However, I don't think it's part of the sort of cleanup of our initial <laughs> approach. Um, so I support talking about it later on. Thank you. Just a, a quick um, comment. We did speak with Uvis County staff who've implemented a reservation system for very similar reasons that most park systems are experiencing the super high level of visitation and they don't have that much parking. And so we've picked their brains a little bit on how they're using theirs. We've got a bunch of follow-up questions that we haven't received answers to yet, but we'll keep working on that and trying to learn from them as well as from uh, a few other agencies 
that I think um, have had theirs for a little bit longer. And so we'll try to learn from, from all of them and, and try to understand what might fit well for us for discussing, as you said, at a later point. Thank you. Any other comments on reservation system? Nope, I think we got okay. it. Okay. Side barbecues. Uh, the ad hoc committee supports removing nine hillside barbecue pits at Foothills Park to help improve fire safety in the preserve. I had shared in the attachment and in our previous um, January meeting a report that we had generated that showed where these are. Uh, the ad hoc committee recommends that staff continue to evaluate the remaining Foothills barbecue pits for fire safety. And just to note, this was in response to the extreme uh, 2020 wildfire season that open space staff had analyzed our picnic areas in Foothills for fire safety. And that report had made note of the six different day use picnic areas and that staff had looked at those hillside ones and noted that they're not very frequently used, um, very infrequently rather, and staff believe that removing them will not have a negative impact on the visitor experience, um, but it will make fire safety um, improvement at the park. I should note one other thing, that removing these nine barbecue pits would still leave 28 barbecue pits located at the Orchard yeah. Glen picnic area and the two large group uh, pic, uh, barbecue pits at Oak Grove. Great, that's good to know, thank you. Sure. Um, Jeff, comments? Yeah, I, the only comment I would have is I'm actually in favor of moving, uh, m removing more barbecues and just because of the fire danger, re really evaluating uh, the use of fires at all in the park, but um, definitely endorse removing the ones um, on the hillside as soon as possible. Thank you. Jackie? Same here. I think it's important to take um, these ones out and see how it goes. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. And this has kind of been on our agenda for quite a while, so it'd be nice to get it done um, in March. Other commissioners' comments? I strongly agree with Jeff Lemaire about getting rid of these nine and, and getting rid of more later. Um, so absolutely. I agree with the same. I agree also, it's sort of a pilot removal. And so yeah, I agree a pilot with you, removal, that's good, yeah. <laughs> good, and then I think we, and, and we'll see how the fire system is, uh, goes this year, um, but I think it'd be good to revisit it in the summertime and, and see as well. So Darren, is that enough for you? Yes, it is. Okay. Darn if we aren't going to get a pilot program. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, the dog policy, the ad hoc did not support making any changes to the existing dog policy for Foothills Park. And those are the dogs are required to be unleashed at all times and not permitted in Foothills Park on weekends and holidays. The ad hoc did agree, just like the previous one, that this should be reviewed again at some point in, uh, later on in the year. So ad hoc, any comments? Uh, my only comment is we're, we're changing a lot of things all at once. I'd like love to just not change uh, another role and, and use our studies to really inform further changes. Thank you. Jeff? Uh, no additional comments. Great. Other commissioners? Third bucket. Yeah, I, I would love to see all dogs um, left out of the park, but uh, this will do for now. Well, and I think that um, in some of the work that the stakeholder group is doing, there's some educational tools that um, we can, uh, we'll be able to use about dogs in the park too and um, behavior. So hopefully that will help. So, okay, I think we can move on on this, Darren, unless you need something else. No, just to confirm that this would fall into the category where we're not making a- we're Not any making any changes. Yeah. 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 Keeping it just the same. Yeah. I mean, the thing that bothers me is that we don't know if dogs really affect the wildlife. We don't have any insight into that, but that's a long-term question. So I, I don't do anything now, but we really should get some experts to talk about the impacts of, uh, to the wildlife if, of all this park visiting, not just it's dogs. Not, it's, yes. not just, it's not so much the dogs, it's the dog owners and picking up their, uh, 
their uh, waste and um, and not um, letting their dogs go so go so far off the trail. That's what's so frustrating. It's not the dogs, it's the owners. Usually the case. Okay. All right. Uh, the photography and videography policy, the ad hoc um, notes that there is an existing parks and open space regulation pertaining to commercial uh, photography and filming and did not feel any additional policy action was necessary at this time. Uh, I include the links on that, but if you'd like, I'm glad to share uh, some of the highlights from the policy, if that would be helpful or turn it back to the chair. Does that have anything to do with uh, weekends and holidays versus weekdays? It does not. No. So they could come anytime. Well, not anytime. If if it's a commercial uh, enterprise, and that's what we're talking about with this policy, is that in certain situations they'd need a permit, and we would govern like what we do with all our permits, when and where and how many and all those details. But there's currently not a fee structure for permits. All the permits are not. Permitted. No. I mean, I would want to be mimic all the surrounding parks. What does Santa Clara and San Mateo County do? I can do some homework on that. They have fees, and I, I, I would suggest that we put this into the second bucket and uh, do some research on it and consider a, a recommendation for March. And and I I ran into a large uh, photography uh, commercial photography team at Arastra Thero about a month ago. So you're already doing something with them already. Um, I didn't ask them how much they're charging. They were charged for their permit, but they took up a lot of real estate. Yeah, we do have in our municipal code, the ability to charge a fee for this. And it's variable on how much staff time it takes um, and nuances, but it's not spelled out. It's $50 if you've got three cameras and. $75 if you've got five people operating a camera boom. It has none of those details. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a range where can staff can determine based on how much staff time. Like footprint and, and number of hours in the park. Uh, I would point out that this is an issue that city council has raised in, in previous discussions. So I, I think it would be worthwhile for us to do some research on it to understand what the uh, consequences of the actions are and, and, and clarify what the, what our neighbors are doing. Uh, yeah, but given, given the amount of work right now that the staff is doing on Foothill Park, I would recommend that we um, keep the policy the same and just wait and do some research when, you, when the staff can do that, but not as a, a really high priority and come, have a decision or do revisit it in, in um, December. Okay. I don't know what others, how others feel, but I, I think we ought to put it on the maybe list for, for March, given that this is something that council's brought up. Depends on if they can do any research till before then, because I don't want it to come up again with no more research. Correct. But my concern is that if other people have fees and we don't, we may attract people and I don't want to be attracting more people. Or okay, more commercial well, enterprises is the big thing. And, and again, we do have fees. So if someone comes and says, we want to shoot a commercial, they don't do it for free. We do charge them. And again, it's variable depending on what they want. They go through a special use permit through PD with open space weighing in and mm -hmm. different fees are assessed. But I can come back with details on that and try to pick two or three neighboring agencies to find out what they're doing specifically and see if we can borrow best practices if you'd like. But if you don't have time then uh, before March, then uh, I'm happy with moving it out. So pick your battles. Yeah, and maybe Darren would be helpful just to know how often does this come up? Because if it's pretty few and far between, then it may not be something that we need to prioritize. Yeah. 
Very good. Just off the top of my head, I would say it probably happens that we get about six a year requests. But before they couldn't go into Foothills Park at all. Right. And Foothills Park is a lot prettier than Arrastadero, so we may have more demand coming. Very good. I'll, I'll put this in the staff to research and, and come back and work with the ad hoc uh, in more detail. That'd be great, Darren. Thank you. Very good. Uh, the ad hoc reviewed the existing policies on group gathering and the Oak Grove picnic area. And the committee is not in favor, in particular for the Oak Grove. I think we mentioned before that there's 150 people max for that picnic area and there's adjacent parking and the pick and excuse me in the restrooms there so it's 150 capacity for that area uh, we had discussed i think in one of our previous meetings should we be restricting corporate action at that the ad hoc committee noted that they weren't in favor of restricting corporate use of oak grove at this time they felt that restrictions should focus on the number of people and how the facility is used rather than which people use it um, and just a quick recap on what the group policy excuse me, group permit policy is, a gathering permit's required for any group greater than 25 people, and that's for Palo Alto Parks and open space. Um, and then the, yeah, I mentioned the Oak Grove. There's just a, one more detail in the Oak Grove policy that's worth noting, that all members of the party, including guests and caterers, musicians, et cetera, must exit the park before closing. Equipment may not be left uh, after the event. And examples of activities that are not permitted are things like bouncy houses, petting zoos, climbing walls, video boards, laser tag, et cetera. Those are often the kind of requests we get for people who have rented Oak Grove. And so the rangers will ask those details. That, that is listed in the sign-up sheet as you register for the reservation. And it says, if you have any non-open space type requests, discuss it with rangers. So the rangers could say, unfortunately, that's not allowed during a preserve. And Darren, tents were in that list, right? Um, I, no, it's not in this, it's this example list, but yes, that would probably fit in depending on what they were proposing. Yeah, I'm thinking back to the Palantir event at Coverly where they had floors and they had uh, tents and they had uh, music, uh, boom boxes and, and, and all kinds of stuff. I don't want that. <laughs> Okay, Jeff. Thoughts, Jeff? Uh, just that we didn't want to restrict who was using it, as, as Darren had said, but uh, the Rangers have experience and discretion in understanding what's allowed and, and best use of the park. Um, one question I do have, and I don't remember if we covered this, uh, with reservation policies, are we doing anything um, to give residents priority over reservations of group areas or anything in terms of like we do with uh, Enjoy where residents have a week ahead of time of registration or anything like that? Yes, as part of the lawsuit settlement, all the reservable areas in Foothills Park, residents have um, a priority of 25% of the reservable time. So in the case of Toll Camp, Oak Grove and the classroom, they're year in advance reservations. So it's a year in advance for residents, nine months in advance for non-residents. Thank you. Jackie? Nothing to add. Okay, other commissioners thoughts on this? I agree, there's big public backlash with the whole Palantir stuff. We got so many people mad at yeah. us. I think we need to look at the lessons we learned from Palantir and make sure that we don't repeat the same mistakes. Luckily with them, it took them about a week to set up and a week and five, four days to, to shut down. So the idea that uh, you have to have everything, you can't have every, anything overnight, uh, I think that will help. I think we should further consider the, the pros and cons of corporate group reservations, particularly since this is something the city council raised last night and if, if we don't uh, have a, a position on this and uh, do some research and, and provide some data on it, uh, 
it's possible they they could choose to act uh, uh, on on their own without without our input. So I, I think it's I think we it's something we should consider. What did they say specifically? Uh, there were some just general ask, just ask about the corporate any corporate policies if that would be discussed. Jeff, did you have other information? No, that, that's all. And, and Darren, just getting back to the uh, reservation policy, it, it sounds like there isn't any need for the commission or council to develop further policy on it. That, that that's spelled out within the terms of the, the settlement. And so that's enough for staff to go on. Yes, that's my understanding. Great, thank you. Sure. Good. Okay, so do people want to put, try to put this on for uh, the March or do you want to get more information? Put it on for March. Yeah, me too. Okay, Darren, let's move on to the next one. Sure. Is there any other uh, feedback that might be helpful? Um, so I can check with other agencies. But is there any other, any other commissioners feel that we should be banning corporate? It would just help me a little bit to... From yeah, I think Darren, uh, Sheriff, sure, if I could just say one thing. Sure, go um, ahead. So some of it is uh, obviously the Palantir sticks in everyone's mind. And so there needs to be a belief and trust of the decision making of, of those that are handling these permits to, you know, appropriately um, look out for the park and, and the, the correct uses. And so I guess we're, you know, certainly deferring and relying on that expertise and trusting in that. And I think that's some of it is that how much do you need to put in writing uh, to ensure something like Palantir doesn't happen again? I'd even go one step further. I think I heard Darren mention the word musicians and I'm thinking of musicians and or DJs and boom boxes and even PA systems where you're going to have the CEO uh, making, um, you know, speeches. Um, how loud can it be, and how much amplification do you want? Uh, the, the Rangers have to have some guidelines, um, and I don't know what's happened in the past. Well, we have existing noise ordinances mm -hmm. um, that are already in place to protect from that. And the use of Oak Grove by the existing uh, policies couldn't exceed 150. So whatever Palantir, if they wanted to rent Oak Grove, they'd be doing the same thing that someone would do on the birthday party if they had 150 people. Um, so there would, there would be no exemptions or extra things allowed as, as it stands with the policy as it is. I think the thing I was trying to understand is, uh, are we looking at just banning corporate altogether. Um, I would not be in favor of banning corporate altogether. What is the policy right now for Mitchell Park, for example? I don't believe there is a policy that prohibits um, a company from renting a picnic area at Mitchell. Likewise at All right, Frank um, Hills. Yeah. I think what might be helpful for the March discussion Maybe even maybe even more so than outside agencies comparing what they are what the um, other agencies are doing is looking at sort of a, at a, on a density level what the different parks permit um, within Palo Alto and so how how the Oak Grove policy compares to Coverly or Rinconado or the other parks um, just so you can see kind of how it differs. And I would like to know about Rancho San Antonio. I would like to know about. Quest to Park, um, you know, are, are we the only game in town or, um, or do they allow these things as well? And what about the Baylands? And what about um, uh, Raster there or Preserve? Do you, well, they don't have picnic tables. You have that one picnic area at Baylands. Have you ever had a, an event out there? No. no. It's, it's sized according to the, the associated amenities. So there are enough picnic tables at Oak Grove and associated parking and restroom that for our history at the park, it's accommodated 150 without trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, Baylands is very different. There's no adjacent restroom. There's lots of parking, 
but there's only four picnic tables and four barbecue pits. So it's, it's really small. We don't have uh, large groups out there. And I think the same could be said for most of the other picnic areas. It's highly variable depending on which area. So at Mitchell and, and Mitchell, where you've got some group picnic areas, I could come back with the numbers, but it's really dependent on how many trash cans, picnic tables, you, and parking you have available associated with that picnic area. I don't think we want to ban corporate groups altogether, but we, we may want to put some constraints on it and perhaps require approval for a, a for-profit corporate group of rent, renting the area to go through the community service group, community services director. For example, if a, a company has a service day organized in the park and they're going to do some cleanup and they want to have a barbecue afterwards, absolutely, we want to support that. We want to encourage that. Uh, we may want to ha have some guidelines beyond that, but I, I think it's something that merits some, some consideration. I'm not, I don't know if we get this done by the end of next month or, or four weeks from now or, or not. Well, we can try. How's that? Is the, Aaron, when we talk next month, let's talk about what the noise ordinance is because I'm concerned that if it's so many decibels, that's really hard to enforce. Mm -hmm. So, but let's not talk about that tonight. Yeah. It is, by the way, decibels. Uh, is there any other, aside from Oak Grove, which we've mainly talked about, other group uh, permits that you, you want to discuss? For Foothill, no. Now you said there were six picnic areas. I didn't know there were six. I only know of two. Yeah, I can pull up the, uh, if you'd like me to toggle down to the picnic area. Um, I've got photos of them if you want to see it. For example, Oak Grove. Right. Orchard Glen. Pine Gulch. But oh. I think we're talking about group permit policy right now. Yeah. Oak yeah. Grove is the only picnic area that, that is uh, reservable via permit. Yeah. Okay, so no other no other group permit policy mm -hmm. questions I should look into. For the time being. Okay. Uh, environmental monitoring and data collection. I think we've talked in the past about what grassroots and open space is doing in terms of monitoring the ad hoc's supportive of that, and uh, in addition to that effort recommends that the recommendations being worked on by the stakeholder group, I discussed this in the staff report, I believe, um, that's looking into people, infrastructure and the environment, come back with any recommendations on the environmental portion and discuss them with the full commission. Yep. In addition to that, it's forming partnerships with universities and local colleges for additional environmental research study. This is also something that's coming apart from that aforementioned stakeholder group where we have some folks from Stanford and uh, Jasper Ridge who are uh, really engaging and helpful and willing to talk to students about doing future research studies in Foothills Park where we can gain valuable data. The only thing that, that I would add to this is, is just the suggestion of, a, of an established docent program for the future that continue could be discussed. But this is really a, a later on. I, I'd like to suggest that we just rename this and and I came up with this name and originally but Sh Shawnee Kleinhouse had a much better suggestion I think in her comments. I think this should be an environmental resource management plan and what you have listed really is it becomes a subset of that. But I think that's a, a better uh, umbrella to, to encompass what we're after. So that was environmental resource management plan. Any other uh, comments on this? topic. And Chair, am I correct that this would not be an action item um, for our March meeting? Uh, 
I don't know. I think maybe it just belongs in the category of the list that uh, like the entry fee and all of that. Uh, I just meant that you don't need a motion to it. It could just go in the staff report to yeah. reflect what we've that, just talked about. Yes. Okay. That's. Well, was there I can see the situation where we might want to tell council we are concerned about this and prep them to, if not immediately in the long run, have some reaction to this. Because right now we're doing nothing. And we're just hoping that we're not damaging the wildlife or damaging the environment. So I think we have to start making the plan and, and socializing the fact that a plan is needed with council. Maybe council member Ku could comment further on this, but are there details that we should be providing that would help for the purpose of budgeting for next fiscal year because we're not we're not doing much right now because it's, it's difficult to do and it's expensive to do uh, but if we're going to need some funding for this then we need to be planning in advance for that yeah i think there needs to be some milestones uh that we can show progress as uh, Keith said, uh, we don't want to show nothing. There is stuff being done. What's being done? Who, what are the partnerships that we started work? Who, is, who have we started working with? Uh, what kind of meetings have we had? Uh, in other words, can we, can we have some progress milestones um, bearing in mind that we really can't have too many tours and and work groups as long as COVID is still out there, but uh, we should be working towards that so that by the end of the summer, uh, there are people um, uh, running, uh, uh, ready to go. Right. I think that would make uh, council feel better. Well, why don't we then put it in for March so that we can maybe just an outline of, of what's being done at this point, which will that make people feel better, do you think, Keith? From your- Yeah, I mean, certainly, time? I think we should be talking about it. And even if our talking has say that we've, we're going to do this and going to do that, but don't have all the answers. That's at least the first step. I think the, some of the council members are forgetting about the fact that our primary purpose in life is to protect Foothills Park or Foothills mm -hmm. Preserve. We're thinking more about parking spaces than we are about wildlife. Okay. Don't forget the natural environment too. Yes. Okay, well, let's try to get that on for, for March. And then I agree with you, David, that um, we need to put together a timeline for some of these things to be accomplished. And some of it will be budget driven and some of it will be with our partners. So it actually is a very exciting initiative. So I'd be ha happy to have other people be excited about it as well. Yeah, I'm cautiously optimistic that budget will not be as much of an issue because mm -hmm. of partners who are very willing to work with us. Mm -hmm. There's a lot we can do. I think so. I don't know if there's much needed for this one. The term between vehicle entrance fee and parking fee, the ad hoc supports using vehicle entrance fee. Parking fee suggests you could enter or drive through the preserve for free. Um, and as long as you're not parking, you could stop as long as you're not staying and getting out of your car, it would all be fine. It's really not practical in <laughs> the hills to have something like that work. Um, it would be a challenge operationally. I, I think agree. we're yeah. I think we're we're using that right now. Jackie and Jeff, do you want to add anything? Pretty self-explanatory. Nothing, Dan. Other comments. 
from everybody? No. Okay. So vehicle entrance fee it is, Darren. Very good. I don't know that this needs to be an action item. Um, maybe again, just captured in the, mm -hmm. in the report. Okay. And sure, that wraps it up. I was just going to say, <laughs> I have a feeling that that wraps it up. Um, so gosh, my um, compliments to you, Darren, for putting the slides together, but also to the commission for uh, thoughtful comments. It, would, it seemed like a very daunting list when we looked at it in January or whenever as we looked at it. And I'm sure that there will be lots of things that will get added to the list and get revised and get rediscussed and all of that. But um, I, think, I think it's good at this point. So here's the next steps. Very good. And, and immediately for staff, I'll do the research that the commissioners have asked for during this meeting, confer with the ad hoc probably more than once to go through all these things and, and try to really package together a thoughtful um, response to each of these to make our March 23rd meeting effective and efficient and hopefully successful that we don't have to wordsmith too much on a motion. Um, does that sound like a reasonable next step? Yes, I was just going to say if we could have some motions to look at or a motion to look at um, and uh, avoid wordsmithing every piece of it, I think that would be very useful for everybody's time and energy. Very good. Staff's got a lot to work on on this issue and we'll, we'll get on it right away. Well, and, and doing a good job too. So um, thank you and thank the staff that's working on it. But I think everybody should give themselves a big round of applause because that was a lot to get through tonight, um, especially after our late start. So thank you all very much. Yeah, yeah thank you very much to the, the ad hoc and, and staff for putting together this uh, to help us get through this quickly. Just one quick thing on, on next steps. Just wanted to highlight the city council had requested that the commission return to them with a, a status update in August timeframe. So that suggests that we aim to have some something on our agenda for July uh, to, to review what, where, where we're at at that point and forward the input to city council. And that, that could that could be a, a new recommendation with, with changes or it could just be a status update as, as far as I'm, I'm interpreting that. And might as well throw the December one in also. Yeah, I think so. Very good. Okay, so I think we can move on to the next um, topic on the agenda. Um, Darren, could you put up the um, screen for um, the ad hoc and liaisons? So we looked at this last time we had a meeting um, and everybody, I believe, was in agreement about the liaisons that were listed, excuse me, about the ad hocs that were, that were listed. We kind of combined some and changed some. And I didn't hear from anybody that we wanted to add anything at this point. And so the task tonight so that we can take action on this is to um, have all commissioners pick which ad hocs they'd like to be on for the next year and um, get that settled so that we can uh, do a motion and pass that on. Uh, um, Chair, one question. You really still think that one Foothills uh, ad hoc is enough? Well, here's the deal. I, I actually think it would be great if we had a second one, but we can't because of the Brown Act. So um, it may, and Darren can probably, or Kristen can explain it better than I can because they're much more familiar with the Brown Act, but I believe that we are only allowed to have one um, ad hoc on Foothill Park at this point. Um, That's correct. Perhaps when the ad hoc gets our job done, we would create a different ad hoc for, for different parts in the year. But I think, I think I'm right on that, Darren. That is correct, yeah. It was too risky to have serial meetings in the opinion of our attorney. So to go through this list, um, we have the, the Baylands Tide Gate um, fund development for um, CY21. Um, given the fact that 
the CIP review uh, didn't have a lot to discuss this last time and got put off a little bit. Uh, I am not so sure we need to put people on that committee right now. Uh, Foothill Park, Foothill Policy. Um, Excuse me, Sheriff, can, can I interrupt and ask Darren, could you expand the, uh, could, could you make this bigger for us, please? Oh, sure. Thanks, sorry about that. The park and facility use policy has morphed into racket court policy. And that that's really given the, the new direction from council about the uh, boards and commissions rules about having a specific topic to address for the ad hoc. Um, and then park improvements is now gonna be called dog park and restroom um, restrooms and recreational rock opportunities has been shortened and changed to new rec opportunities. So um, in the past, what I remember is that uh, commissioners have uh, signed up for a particular volunteered for a particular committee of interest. And I think we have um, six committees. Seven, one, two. Seven, yeah. Actually, if, if, we, if we populate the CIP review, we have seven and we have seven commissioners. So, um, and we'd like to have two or three commissioners on each ad hoc. At least I thought so, David, it was kind of lonesome being on, just having two people on our dog committee. Uh, no comment. No comment, okay. Just a, just a quick question for staff as far as the CIP review ad hoc. I, I agree this is something that we should we should create uh, given, the, given the guidelines of the, the new uh, manual for boards, commissions, and committees. Does, would it seem more appropriate to create the, the ad hoc committee later or is it reasonable to do it now? I'm not quite I, I think it's reasonable to do it now, Vice Chair. Great, thank you. Okay, good. I'd so, like a, I'd, like a, I'd like a show of hands of how many people would like to be on that Foothills policy um, ad hoc. All right. Well, I think almost everybody does, right? Right. So I think that's the one that we should start with and uh, the rest uh, the rest will fall out. Okay, well, let's start with that one. I have, I have been on the Foothills Ad Hoc and have enjoyed it very much. Um, and I'm happy to um, step back this year and um, do something else, so. I've been on it since I believe 2018. And while I enjoy the continuity and having sort of learned very much about it and been deeply involved in the policy, I am will also uh, step away to provide opportunities for other commissioners. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you for your service on that. You know, we talked about how long you've been on that, on that ad hoc committee. Um, really appreciate your thoughtfulness and your work. I, yeah, I too am happy to uh, share the love and <laughs> <laughs> have some fresh blood. Um, for, for those who are really eager, I'm also happy to continue. Um, but I, I do think it's important to hear as many voices as possible on this. So um, I think we should just start fresh on that one. Yep. Well, I think so too. And I, I, it's really that my, it would be my goal for every ad hoc that people really um, pick what they want um, and be passionate about it and also have some turn over the committees and have some some new blood and some new way of thinking and some new perspective. So um, should we raise hands for the Foothill uh, Committee starting out with that one? David? Darren, are you keeping notes with this too? Because last year I remember I didn't and I was surprised to find myself on a committee that I didn't uh, <laughs> don't remember yes. signing up for it. I was trying to participate on another committee. Yes, I, I will take notes. Thank you so much. I see the vice chair. Yes, I'm interested if, if, if a spot is available. Thank you. It appears to be. 
I'm looking for another hand. Okay, well, let's leave that one and go on to the Baylands Tide Gate. Sorry, I guess I'd like to ask Jackie, you said you're interested in staying on um, potentially. I, I think it's important to have three people on in that group. Uh, and, and, and I think it'd be helpful to have some continuity. So I don't know if- Yeah, I, I would want at least one of the people from last year to continue on. Otherwise you're starting from scratch. Yeah, I think it might also um, for Commissioner Brown's benefit, be good to explain a little bit about how many of these we end up being on. Um, Three. It looks like I was on four before. Um, um, so I think we can probably go through and get our first couple on each one and then try to fill in the blanks with. Yeah, that's what I actually was trying to do. So thank you very much to get two on the Foothill ad hoc and then go to other ones. But if we want to do that, Jackie, if you want to stay on that committee, that's great. Because I, I do agree about the, con the continuity. Sure, I'm happy to continue on. Great, thank you. So Balin's tied. Darren, could you um, talk a little bit about what that committee might do? Yeah, thank you, Chair. So far, what it's involved was conversations with Valley Water and learning about exactly what they were proposing, proposing counter alternatives. For example, the ad hoc was really effective in getting them to explore alternative closure windows of the, the levy system that they mm -hmm. need to access. Uh, so I think it's review of design that will be coming up soon when they eventually bring a park improvement ordinance. I imagine the ad hoc would do an early iteration review of that. And then just further discussions offline with staff and the Valley Water team. And just as a point, Valley Water has um, grants available and money, right? Oftentimes, yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, any volunteers on the Valley Water? I'm interested in staying on this uh, group just to see you through for continuity. I initiated some of the discussions with, with the group and we've been very productive. And uh, I, I think this is a, an ad hoc that would probably be disbanded after the initial plan. I don't, I don't know, you, I don't know if it would continue after the initial plan is put in place or continue monitoring. I'm not sure, quite sure about that. We'd have to figure that out. Other? I, I'm interested, although if others are interested, I certainly can step off. Okay, Keith, I'll note that. Okay, let's move on to fund development. I'm interested in staying on this committee. I can uh, help out with that. I'm interested in making room for someone else. <laughs> uh, I'd be interested in being on this one. Mandy, mm -hmm. is that you? Great. Yes, that's me. Perfect. Okay, then the CIP review. David? I mean, in the past, didn't sometimes we just have a single person do this? Is this like a liaison? No, or? we had, no, it wasn't a liaison. We had a committee actually. Well, I mean, some years I was the committee of one. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I remember, I, I do remember that. But uh, I think it's really good, especially for the newer, people to see how C the CIPs work. But uh, I don't know if it needs a big crew in there. Okay, well, let's, let's leave it for a little bit. I found it very, very, the, for the short time I was on it this year, I found it very, very interesting. Um, racket court policy. 
This is tennis and pickleball specifically. I've been involved with this for, for four years and I think uh, some new blood would be good. I think, I think there's some interesting things coming up regarding tennis and, and pickleball to be involved with. Definitely. Okay, um, dog park and restrooms. Any takers on that one? This was a big part of our, our master plan or continues to be about putting more dog parks in parks and putting more bathrooms in parks as well. Mandy has a dog, right? I do. It's being quiet right now. Uh, yeah, I'd be interested in being in this one. Okay, well, Mandy, I will join you there. And new rec opportunities. Uh, I'd like to remain on that ad hoc. And that's the one I thought I was on last year. So I'd like to go on that one. I'd be interested in staying on that. Uh, but again, if, if people have strong feelings, I'm willing to step off. Okay, so here's the, the scorecard right now. Jeff and Keith are on the uh, Baylands Tide Gate. Jeff, Lemaire, Anne and Mandy are fund development. David is CIP review. Foothills policy is David, Jeff and Jackie. We have nobody for racket court policy. Um, Mandy and Ann are dog parks and restrooms and new rec opportunities are Jeff and Keith and Ann. Um, this is Jackie. I can sign on for racket court policy. Great. And painted lines on the courts, right? That's great. Thank you. Okay, so Darren, I'll coordinate with you and maybe we can send this list out and give people a couple more days to fill in some of the blanks. Uh, Chair, if we're taking an action tonight. Oh, that's right, we can't do that. Yeah. Okay, thank right. you. Right now, is Jackie the only one on record court? Yes. Yeah. Okay, you can add me. Great. And we have one person in CIP. We have time to add someone later on that. Since it, since it won't be convening for quite some time. Uh, I'm happy to be on that one. You can add me to CIP. As oh, well. good, Jeff. And who else said that they were happy to Mandy. be on that? It was Mandy. Great. Well done, I think we got it. So if we're taking action on this, Darren, do you need to put this up on the screen so everybody can see it or? Um, certainly can, it's gonna take me a second to type it up or we can That's just- That's okay, but we can go through the uh, liaisons as well. Do you need do to have like an action? Do you like me to type it up? Huh? I said, would you like me to type that up or just, um... We could read it off as all. I, th I think we can. I think we can read it off. I was going to say though, if you wanted to type it up, we oh, could sure. go. Th we could go through the liaisons while you're typing it up, and I'll take the notes. Sure. Okay. So, um, 
aquatics I've been doing for a long time. Um, I'm happy to step back if somebody else would like to do that liaison work. I don't hear anybody, so I guess. You have the credentials, Anne. I'll stay there. <laughs> um, BCCP. Oh, sorry, I'm at the wrong. Yeah, um, I'm on the wrong list. Baylands 10.5 development. Somebody would like to be a liaison on that particular yeah. one. Yeah. Jackie. Yep. Yeah. Great. Community gardens. This is Mandy. I'd like to be that. Cubberly. I can do that. David. Field users. I'd like to continue doing that. Yeah, that's good for your continuity, I think. Golf. I'll stay with golf. Thank you, Jeff. GSI. I can give that up. And we leave that open for now? Yeah, there's not much going on. Okay. Uh, Palo Alto Recreation Foundation. I think that's me. I, I, uh, since they've agreed to have you as a liaison. I think you should be our liaison as well. I, <laughs> I know that would be awkward, right? Um, PAUSD um, and the city. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep that. Is that youth, Keith? Yeah, that's Keith. great. Safe routes. I'm interested in keeping that unless someone else is interested in jumping into it. Sustainability. We'll keep that open. Skateboard park. I'll take uh, skateboard park. I've done some work already with, with that. Great. Urban forestry. I'm very interested in that. Ventura plan. Keith, is that something with oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. your, yeah, yes. your uh, knowledge I should, that I you I should need? take that for uh, continuity. Yeah. That's almost done anyway. Yeah, how many millions of dollars can we get out of the Fry's property and yeah, <laughs> for a, a new new park land? Uh, youth, count, youth Council. I will do that one. Okay, Darren, I think we have the list. Um, this is Mandy, I'll do sustainability. That one's still open. Okay, so the only one now that's open is GSI in case anybody just got interested. This is Jackie, I can take it. Right. Thanks to everybody. That's terrific. If Jeff would want help on urban forestry, I wouldn't mind joining like we did last year. Okay. Sure. I don't think we did anything because of COVID, but I'm I'm hopeful that uh, more will be hap happening on that this year. Am I okay to unshare that chair and share the motion page instead? Um, one more comment, and that is that sustainability and GSI are very similar. There's a lot of overlap. So if you want to merge those two, you could do that uh, without much trouble. Okay. Well, let's see how it goes. Right now, we've got liaisons for both of them. So, okay. Darren, would you mind making it a little bigger, please? How's that? Perfect. Okay. I just want to make sure I, I've got these correct. Um, the ad hoc committees meet your list too. 
jerk ribs. Oh, you didn't. Yeah. Um, so we have. A, are you going to write them down, or did you have them written? It's not showing on my screen. No, I don't. I have. Oh, okay, got it. I have the ad hocs only. I've been typing up that while you were. Going to do two things at one time. <laughs> I'd love um, to that. Aquatics is um, cribs. Okay. Baylands 10.5 is Jackie. Community Gardens is Mandy. Cubberly is David. Field users is Jeff. Field uh, golf is Jeff Lemaire. GSI is Jackie. Palo Alto Recreation Foundation is Cribs. PAUSD. City slash city is Keith. Safe routes is Jeff. Sustainability is Mandy. Skateboard is Jeff. Is it skate park or skate? Skate, skate park. Yeah, for yeah. Jeff Lemaire. Jeff Lemaire, thank you. Skateboard Park. Skateboard Park. <laughs> okay. Urban forestry is uh, Greenfield and Recto. Ventura Plan is Keith. And Youth Council is Cribs. Good work, everybody. Yeah. It's a great roster. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt this as listed. Good. I'll second. Excellent. Um, Catherine. Oh, is there any discussion? Nope. Catherine, would you uh, do a vote? Commissioner Cripps? Yes. Commissioner Greenfield? Yes. Commissioner LaMare? Yes. Commissioner Olson? Yes. Commissioner Moss? Yes. Commissioner Rectal? Yes. Commissioner Brown? Yes. Seven to approve the motion. Great. Congratulations, everybody. It'll be another fun year. Um, tentative agenda for um, March 23rd. I think we pretty much know what it is. It's Foothill Park. Um, but Darren, were there other things? I, I think that is gonna be the, the, the dominant one, Chair. I don't think I've got anything else, but I'll confer with other um, staff, both in CSD and Public Works as usual, see if they've got anything outlined that they need on. Great, I think after tonight, probably it would be good to have a only Foothill Park meeting and so we'll wait and see. Very good. Okay. Any um, comments or announcements and announcements? Karen, um, Tim Wong was supposed to um, talk about the housing in Palo Alto. Do you just want me to share the flyers since he went off the attendees at the beginning of the meeting? I don't know uh -huh. what happened. Yeah, I think two things. One is maybe we could pop it up real quick if that's okay with the chair and uh, alternatively, we could just email it to the commission as well. Yeah, I can email it, whatever they prefer. Since you and I don't really have the background to talk them through it, perhaps that would be the most prudent is just to okay. email it. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. So any other announcements? We have our um, retreat coming up soon i was going to mention about the uh, ramos uh, park and and the off-leash dog parks and but uh darren beat me to it in his staff report so 
I don't think there's much that I need to add to that. Uh, I think that's going to be the big challenge for the dog park people is where to put an off-leash dog park next yeah. year. I mean, this year. That's it. Okay, well, if there's no other comments um, or any other announcements, we could entertain a, a motion to adjourn. Um, but I would thank everybody before we do that and say good work tonight. Um, I know it was a lot to get through um, and a lot to sit through, but I feel like everybody had the opportunity to um, make comments and, and um, do what, what we're all trying to do, which is the best for the park, both the environment and for the enjoyment of the visitor experience. So thanks and special thanks to staff. Gosh, you know, we really recognize what a great job you guys are doing um, supporting us. And I think it was really um, clear last night. I think the council, as I said, was very pleased um, at um, the work of the staff and also the commission. So um, it, it's really great to have you guys as part of the team. So thank Thanks you. So much. Thank you, Darren. Please convey that to Absolutely. the rest of your staff that aren't here with us so late tonight. Absolutely. So thank anyhow, you. is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. <laughs> I second. <laughs> Uh, can we do it all in favor? Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you so Bye. much. Bye. Good night. Good night. Thank Good night. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.